Okay, I'm going to open the Board of Selectmen's meeting. It is September 20th. It is 6.04. Um, first thing on the agenda is if I can get a motion on waiving the reading of the Zoom. So moved. And do I have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> All right. Aye. Um, let's see what else we got. So we got Treasury Warrant and Payroll, uh, approval of Treasury Warrant 22W6 and Payroll 22PW6. Do I have a motion on? A motion to approve, do as have, said, mm -hmm. written. And do I have a second? second. All right, roll call. Carol, aye. Benoit, aye. <laughs> aye. Uh, Nichols, aye, with excluding any uh, Council on Aging wages. And then we have approval of the minutes from the meeting on September 7th. So right. moved according to how they're written. Do I have a second? I cannot second because I was not at that meeting. Okay, can I second myself? <laughs> I can second, yeah. yeah. All right, I second. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And Mitch abstains. It's going to be a quick night with nobody here. <laughs> 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 All right, actually, I should, uh, we should do the pledge. I'm sorry. I should do the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> all right. Do we have anybody for open comment? <coughs> Who's in the way? Jeff. Jeff Stillings, he just joined, oh. so I'm not sure if he has public comment. Actually, uh, through the chair, if I may, I would like to uh, address the board through public comment if uh, Mr. Stillings has nothing for public comment. Jeff, do you have any, com are you here for public comment? No, I'm good. Okay, thank you. All right, Mitch. <coughs> Leah, okay. Leah is now present, so just to, so people are aware. Go Great. Ahead, so you can all hear me, okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. I wanted to address the board um, because of a career change and a new opportunity. Um, I am actually not uh, allowed or permitted to continue my service on this board, so I will be resigning um, from this position effective this evening. Um, I did want to thank everyone that I've served with. I will be issuing a more lengthy comment. I mean, everything's kind of moved kind of quickly, um, but I did want to uh, to make the board aware um, and uh, just, uh, I guess, go ahead and, and thank the community and everybody we've worked with over the last, in particular, 16 or so months to kind of get the community through um, the pandemic, we've worked with a lot of great people um, and everybody we've served with. So I did want to uh, to make that statement. Again, I'll be issuing something a little bit more lengthy um, in the coming days for <coughs> folks and for staff. Uh, but I did want to uh, to make the, uh, the chair and board aware. All right. Well, thank you. We, we you know, accept your resignation with regret and we appreciate your service to the town and uh, what you've done to support the board. And, other, and all the other committees. So will you not be on the other committees, Mitch? Um, again, my, the, <clears throat> because of the uh, career situation, I am not permitted to serve uh, moving forward on, um, it would be a conflict on town boards and commissions. So, okay. so um, you'll, you'll be resigning from all committees as well? I'm going to have to okay. uh, unfortunately do that, unless it's ad hoc, correct. <clears throat> all right, thank you. Thanks, Mitch. Good luck with everything. Thank you, Leah. Yep. Yeah. Do you have, do you have comment? just a comment, Mitch? I, I also I just wanted to thank you. It, it was a pleasure working with you. Uh, you were the chair when I came in, and um, you know we had regular conversations about a host of issues, and I always appreciated your input. Uh, it was a pleasure, and I wish you uh, the very best of luck in your new endeavor. Thank you, Ron, and I I can't tell you how many people that I've had conversations with. Uh, over the last few weeks and few months during uh, 
this kind of career shift that uh, have very high opinions of you, sir. So I think the town is, is personally lucky to have you. I know it's been an adjustment. I know that you came in when there was a lot going on. Um, so I, I certainly think that uh, the town is, is going to be in good hands in your stewardship. Thank you, sir. All right. Anybody else have any other comments? Mr. Chairman, just two comments about that. Um, yeah. We are going to then need uh, select board representatives on two uh, committees, so to speak, or two discussions. One is on the uh, sewer line that goes through Holden. Uh, Mitch was going to be the representative from the board on that issue. And the second issue is that we need a representative on the uh, group that's being formed uh, of all the five towns looking at school issues uh, and budget issues. So we will need uh, representatives to bring back whatever we're working on back to the board. Selectman. Of course, I'm going to do it too if they need it, but it would be good. If I may, through the chair, um, <coughs> yep. I'm more than happy to uh, work with Ron to provide some memos and briefings for the chair and the vice chair uh, to review, to update them um, as we move forward and kind of close this out, uh, close the loop so that everyone's on the same page um, and just make everything uh, as easy uh, of a transition as possible for all of those involved. And if that means continuing to work with Ron for the next couple of weeks to get that stuff uh, situated um, and documented, then I'm more than happy to do that. Great. We appreciate that. So uh, mm -hmm. we'll put it on the agenda for the next meeting. Okay. We'll also need it at one point. Um, I elect a new clerk. Oh, and a new and, and a new clerk, correct? So we'll we'll put all three of those on the agenda for next in our next meeting for our next regular select board meeting. Um, so we had department head upda updates. Um, unfortunately, Becky was unable to come tonight. Um, I don't know if Dan is, is Dan still planning on coming tonight? Do we know? Not heard anything. You haven't heard sure. anything? So I'm not sure on that. Um, and just, Scott, you want, I guess Scott, Scott's going to fill in as uh, one of the department heads just to give us a quick update. Uh, no specific discussions on anything that would, you know, be an issue as far as since it wasn't on the agenda. So yep. just an update on the current situation would be appreciated. So currently 28 cases in isolation, uh, pretty much three, two, four come off every day this week. Um, you know, obviously we're still getting more as well. Um, if anything, if, if there's, a, I guess, a break point to it, a lot of these cases of this 28 are all maybe five or six households. So you're not getting, like we were originally way back in the spring, you'd have 30 people and they'd all be from 30 different addresses. Now it's 30 people and five different addresses so it's just it's because of the, the the way the new variant is it's just more you know people more susceptible it's more contagious so now more people in the house are getting it whether they're you know staying in rooms or quarantining themselves or what so I guess that's a good thing you know it, it just means there's less total cases outside of the households which you know is uh you know it's not so many people as, as the number of the state so I guess that's a good thing I guess um, and then just other than, you know, normal, we still have our, our flu clinic is scheduled for November 13th, too. And we're going to do that the Saturday for, um, you know, the children. And as of right now, we're not sure what the FDA is approving. So at some point, we'll, we think we'll be giving booster shots to uh, 65 and older. Um, just waiting for that, them to solidify that. And then the immunocompromised uh, will be giving as needed and whenever they you know, ask for it. And then today, as everybody probably heard, at some point we'll probably be ramping up for five to 12 year olds as well. And did you, did you have something at the schools or something, didn't you? Yep, yeah, last week we, uh, we went to all five uh, towns, um, middle schools, and then the, the high school, and did uh, clinics there. So the students were able to just walk down during the day and get their uh, vaccinations, as well as if their parents wanted to join them, we put it out to the parents of those students to come too. Um, so we're, we're trying to keep that. That's our, I think I mentioned last time, our worst number right now is probably the 12 to 16 year olds as far as percentages for, for um, this area, Rutland included. You know, that, that 12 to 16 is where, you know, the, the numbers are okay, but not great. You know, where, you know, the, the older we get in our, all the town's populations, the numbers of the percentages are amazing, you know. 
It's just that, that and a lot of that might have to do with, you know, accessibility just because vacations and everything over the summer. So that's why we made it easier for them to go to the schools to get it if they need be. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment. It sounds like, if I may, <coughs> sure. um, getting PCR tests outside of anywhere is becoming more and more difficult. This is just kind of for the public as a heads up. Um, yeah. It's a supply chain issue, it sounds like. So um, I think it's on the school's radar also because some of the school <coughs> protocols are dictating that they need a negative PCR test and yep. those results are coming back, taking much longer to find some place that can do the PCR test and then taking much longer. So just for anybody listening, know that that's kind of um, a hiccup right now. Yeah, we, we, we've, I mean, when people come to, like <coughs> someone may call our office and say, my, my son just tested positive, I just said, they ask us, you know, where, and, I mean, we, we try to tell them the best we can, but like you said, you know, it's just, now instead of one person it's now five and the whole family there they're all scrambling to get it but yeah it's, it's been a, a little slow and a little but i i think you know hopefully we'll, I, I keep hearing once we get to october there might be a little downtrend and so maybe that'll give the folks a, a chance to catch up thank you thanks for all the work you guys have been doing mm -hmm. uh, okay. um do you have any information on the schools the is the, the ones in rutland have they increased any proportionately um, to any numbers in the district? I'm wondering how we're doing. Um, you know, I don't. I don't even know if we have an actual every town's um, breakdown. I, obviously, <coughs> as with everywhere else in the country, the, you know, the, the the 16 and under population has jumped in percent. Of, you know, of being positive. But um, I, you know, I don't know how we compare with everybody else in, in that percent. I, mean, I, I think. Of the 28, if I remember right, probably five to seven right now are 16 and under, you know. And a lot of the times that happens to be a mom, a dad, or, you know, two parents, what have you, and two kids. So it just, it just works out that way, you know, because it's so, so much more, you know, easier for, for uh, contagious to, to, to get. Now where if a parent would have it, it would stay in their bedroom and the rest of the family would be fine. Now once it's in the house, it's... Everybody catches it, whether they, you know, quarantine as good as possible in the house. It's just one of those things. Do you know if they're symptomatic or are they, ca are they catching it during um, the like testing? That so so what we're hearing back from our nurse is when she's doing the contact tracing is um, she hasn't seen, and again, you know, she hasn't seen many people who've been vaccinated with anything more than it's a really bad sinus infection, maybe a loss of taste and smell, but... A lot of that comes back pretty quickly, um, and and that you know once the, the the quarantine is over, they're right back at it. You know, it's not before we they people have felt you know after effects. And it's it's not that at all. Um, Unquarant, uh, excuse me, unvaccinated folks are, are, are you know are having a little bit tougher time, especially if they've got you know underlying issues. But um, it a lot of it is it, not funny. But we were saying how quickly people are coming off, and they're fine. You know, it, it's where mm -hmm. there was. People were staying, and our nurse would have to keep going back and back and back, you know, six, eight weeks later just to check on these, these folks who still weren't feeling good. Now she's like, after 10 days, you know, they're back to work, back to regular life as if it was just a bad cold or, you know, or, or a bad, uh, you know, sinus infection or something mm -hmm. like that. Thank you. If I may, um, the wrsd.net website has a COVID tracking board, oh, or, so if anybody's interested, you can go on and click on that. And they seem to be mostly updating it fairly real time, I'm not sure, um, but it did seem like there was a little spike in Glenwood last week, I think. Now that doesn't break down between staff and <coughs> students and mm -hmm. everything, it's just people in, in the building. Um, but and that could be like brothers and sisters. It could be like it a, could be a, a family. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, but <clears throat> for anybody interested in to check on the schools, it's mm -hmm. available on the. Um, it's on the main district website. There's okay. like a COVID tracking tool or something. Thank you. Yeah. Ryan, you had something. Yeah, just two quick things, okay. Scott. Um, in my conversations uh, with your office, um, again, it, it seems that most of the people they're getting are non-vaccinated. But to me, I think I heard almost a third are vaccinated people, and I, I respect what you're saying is that vaccinated people are getting less symptoms, less less of problems. But yeah. is that a pretty accurate number? About one third are vaccinated. And then my second part of my question: this, the state education commissioner um, 
gave a date when he first put out the mandate for the schools across the state is October 12th or something along that line. Has that changed at all, or where are we with that? As of now, I believe that's still there, but I, I know that they're probably meeting, I think, this week, just to discuss that, so I'm not sure. Um, I, I mean, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're pushing to get to that, and that's kind of what we did last week with all the different, uh, you know, all the clinics at all the schools. So, But I, as of right now, it's still as is. But again, like I said, they may change. Yeah, increase the date to later. This yeah, time. and yeah. I don't know if it was so much. And to your first question, I, I don't think it was a third. I would say more like of a quarter, a quarter of all the. the but again, you know, it, it goes on and well, off. And again, yeah, it could be a, a family of five where <laughs> the three children aren't vaccinated because they're that age, right. and the two adults are. But then the adults get it because in the house. So you know, it, yeah. But it, um, but yeah, we we have yet to have really bad. Um, reactions for folks who've been vaccinated that, that we know of, you know. And that's what I wanted to get it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Right. Anybody have anything else? Recording in progress. I just have one <coughs> question. Um, I think I had kind of brought this up with Ron in the email, but at what point do does the town, I assume it would be Board of Health, um, our health agent and the COVID team look at whether to reinstate masks indoors or whatever, just as, Go, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward into we're heading into winter and we know what happened last winter with numbers going up and is there a plan to hopefully do that before there's serious plans of shutting stuff down? Um, you know, Ron and I kind of like just in passing have discussed it. Um, so we're hearing a lot of feedback from, you know, the federal government, the, you know, DPH and things like that, that they think there's going to be a, a lull or a, a, a coming down of cases in October. So we'll definitely be watching that. But kind of what, what I was saying earlier about how the, the cases are different now is, again, back in the spring, if you had 30 cases, it was 30 different people from 30 different households. Now, if you've got 30 cases from five households, all those six people are staying home in quarantine. It's, it's, I think that the, the, the effect is lessening. You know, still, you know, it's very contagious in people. So I, I think, you know, we'll just have to play it by ear. And, um, know that you know the cases are the, the households are less so it's not as rampant as it once as it was back early in the spring but I, I definitely think if it starts getting crazier you know we, we, we were at a high of maybe 40 in the last two weeks we're, we're back down to 28 you know three people fall off tonight and we only get one or whatever we're down to 25 so I, I think we'll, we'll just monitor it and then when we see it starting getting really bad then you know we definitely will have that discussion and put it out there. So you're taking into consideration, if I may, not only the number of cases, but the number of households that those number of cases are impacting kind of a, a little bit. Like there's a lot of yeah. moving pieces yep. to it, if I yeah. understand correctly. So yep. it's not. And, and, and uh, so one, I guess, you know, back when it was, you know, 30 people, 30 households, there was always that possibility that anyone else in that household could catch it. So that 30 people could become, making up a number, 150 overnight, where now, because it's going through the whole household, and that whole household is now staying home for that 10 days in quarantine, there's not so much the spread, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so even though the numbers are bigger, it's because it's the whole household. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I mean, I just was curious, you know, before we get to any talks of not starting programs, shutting stuff down or anything, I just wanted to make sure that they, we could try to have a, a pro proactive impact yeah. before oh, well, yeah. it gets to that point. Yeah. I'm not saying that we're there yet. Yeah. So. Yeah. So it's for you to, to respond. Yeah. So first, thank you for the question. I think it's a very good one, and I know why you're having that discussion because we've been discussing the yeah. recreation and all that. So, so as you probably have learned since I've been here, I'm not one to aptly just start closing things down. This is not what I believe. Uh, but I, I, you know, I think you're going to see not just a problem in Rutland, is we're going to start hearing problems with surrounding communities and department. The State Department of Health will start issuing warnings and stuff. So, by the time it gets to be Rutland, you see a kind of spread of the area. So that's when, you know, whenever some blip happens, I get an immediate call from Rich and Scott start talking. So it, it is as it develops, we will have a feel not only for Rutland, but for the surrounding area to make those kind of decisions. What, I, what I've tried to do, though, and to both this board and to, you know, my department has to say, hey, there is starting to be a little bit of an increase. We're seeing it. Be prepared. I want people that might sign up for a program to be aware that, 
if this does expands get worse, we might have to close down something like that. I just want, when you pay your money to be in a program, I want you to know that there's that chance that public safety is going to kind of, you know, raise above that, and we might have to make those decisions. So I wanted, Nan particularly Nancy, when we were talking about recreation at Karina, to understand that and to advise people when they sign up that that is something we have to consider. But as of now, I have no intention of stopping anything going forward. But if the numbers do increase, that's the kind of time when me and Scott and Rich will be talking and we'll try to figure out what's going on. But I, like I said, I'm not going to act quickly in any of that. I would rather, like you say, go back to mass and things before we have to stop that. Okay? And, and just kind of, <coughs> I just want to, so you know, obviously everybody knows that Worcester just started up today. And, you know, we looked at that and, you know, right now they are, I believe it's 61% fully vaccinated for 12 and up. Mm -hmm. where we <coughs> as a town are pretty much approaching 80. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of that has to do with it too, yeah. you know, where Worcester knows that a lot of their, their, um, their population isn't vaccinated. So, there, you know, there's more folks out there, who, you know, who could get it and, and get it worse. Well, like, and they're a bigger city that have Right, people. exactly. But, but I just saw, like, I think Hubbardston had done it September 1st. Hubbardston went early go back to masks in town spaces, and I think West Boylston just went to the end of last week. And I don't know what their numbers have been or I anything. Think I, 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 I don't want to speak for West Boylston, so but I think Hubbardston was lower than us, so, you know. And that's fine. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that it was, you know, before we get to the point of having to shut things down, that yep. there's metrics in place oh, that God, hopefully yeah. we can oh, mitigate yeah. all you, of that. You know, it's bizarre. There's some towns I don't think have even reopened yet. I mean, it's, no. it's, well, it's exactly. kind of bizarre. Some towns have, I think, gone way over the top with this issue and have never reopened their buildings and stuff. Uh, and I think some towns felt that, oh, you know, we're providing services and nobody seems to be unhappy. Let's keep it closed. But I, I think it's an over-the-top reaction, to be honest with you, in many of the small towns that are doing that. Well, I just wanted to make sure, thank you for yeah. oh, making sure are. all the yeah. pieces are there, so. Yeah. He's going to be my best friend. I'm on the phone with him and Rich all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate Appreciate all your hard work. All right. And then, town clerk, Anita Carlson. Am I okay here or should you I You can be wherever you want. Oh, I think we can hear you wherever you are. I think there's mics all over the place. <laughs> oh, that's good too. <laughs> Hi, camera. Um, well, basically, we're in a, a light election cycle, which is really nice, um, after especially um, 2020 that was so crazy. So it'll, it's allowing us to concentrate on some projects and tasks that, that you know, often take a back seat to when elections are, are right up front. Um, so we've been doing, um, Damien recently mailed um, delinquent dog cards out to owners that haven't licensed their dog yet for 2020, and we've gotten a great response. I think, I have the number, but I don't think I put it here. I think we're at almost 1,560 dogs licensed, and so we, but we still have some um, delinquent dogs out. And uh, we also recently mailed out business certificates, reminders. That, uh, our business certificates are good for four years, so we went back through the files and, and uh, sent reminders to anyone that hasn't um, renewed. And uh, we're at a record high of business certificates. Um, it, I think it's 57 so far this year, and I don't think we hit 40 in all of last year. So it seems like there's a trend going on there. But um, we also have a new dog program that, that's working out really well. Um, we switched recently. It was, we're in, in like a, it was a deal we couldn't refuse. <laughs> it's, it's a trial, and so we're not being charged. And so we're, you know, we're almost like guinea pigs. And um, so um, Damien's in touch with, with them often with suggestions and things like that. So that's keeping us busy. And uh, we're just doing things like um, permanently, I mean, doing more like, um, uh, like with vital records, we're um, putting them into protective binders for, you know, that are more permanent than how we had them filed before. <coughs> and working on updating forms and <coughs> lists and, and things like that. Um, the biggest project that we're working on right now is the handout that I gave you. Um, just a little background. Following every federal census, um, as you 
well, you hear all about gerrymandering and changing precinct lines and everything. So in <coughs> Rutland, um, following, we had one precinct up until the 2020 census, and then it takes a year, almost a year and a half before <coughs> some, you know, an action happens from that census. So in, in the two, census from 2000, we, <coughs> we split into two different precincts, which you can, if on the map that you have, uh, it was basically the, the green was, is, was, in 2020 became, I mean in 2000 became precinct number one, and the other two, the orange and the purple, were precinct number two, which was the library. And um, so that stayed for 10 years, and then following the 2010 census, that's when we had to go to a third precinct. Um, the numbers are based on total population, not the number <coughs> of voters, and it's, it's a 4,000 population per precinct. So we're far away from having to go to a fourth precinct, because uh, we did it just over the, the line in 2010. <coughs> but the state law requires all our precincts to be balanced. And it, there's a, <coughs> so they take, basically they take your total population, and that figure is, is um, their figure from the federal census. And they divide it by three, and so if there's more than a 5% difference between the precincts, we have to shift the lines. So this is a, a draft copy, and we've, Damien and I have seen it for, for the last few years. We're well aware <coughs> that there's um, a lot more people in the existing precinct two, whereas precinct number three, which if you look at the map, is in the purple is a lot of the old developments, or older <coughs> developments. And that um, had a lot less people. So what the state's proposing, and, and we just need to let them know um, that we agree with their numbers, is to move a section. And I, I have to come back again, because I have to ask you to um, basically sign and accept the, the reprecinct plan. And so I think I'll ask to be put on the agenda for maybe probably your next meeting. And, um, and at that time, I'll try to uh, make sure that I get things to Beth early enough so that she can, you know, you can have a bigger visual. But basically what this plan is doing is taking the old precinct number three, if you can see, used to the dividing line was basically Central Tree Road. But this one has expanded it, and so it goes down Glenwood and Muscapah. So we're picking up the second page I gave you. It would move um, approximately 187 residents from Precinct 2 into Precinct 3, and then that will balance our numbers. Of course, a lot of this is we never have really long lines because everybody votes for mail by mail, but we still have to by state law keep the precincts balanced. So we'll have to notify all the homeowners and uh, and and just uh, of the new locations. Um, the only thing that's slightly problematic is that precinct one and three are both at Naclog, and so it's the parking there, but I don't think the state will use, let us use that as an excuse to keep precinct too bigger. Um, we sat down, Damien and I sat down with Dave George and um, he, and to look at projected growth and um, because basically if we don't want, if if things aren't going to stay the same within like the next five years, if we're going to see a bigger growth. But basically, from our initial look-throughs, um, it, it looks like it's going to pretty much stay balanced. That's, a lot of that is contingent on Harbor Homes, <laughs> because if, that, if they come in, um, I think Dave said it's <coughs> 88 to 142 units, and that would be in Precinct 3. 
So, and then right now, um, I think Dave estimated that we probably, Bryce Lemon still has maybe another 60. I, I see Dick mm -hmm. shaking his head to go. Um, and, and I guess, uh, like Retinal Estates is another another 35, and that's in Precinct 2. And then the ANRs off of Retinal are another 10. And then, I don't know, Millican Brook, that's in Precinct no. 2 also. That's going to be a while? That's going to, yes, they didn't submit a have <coughs> definitive plan. Okay. Noble Hill, you haven't mentioned. No, no I know. And, but, and Noble Hill and the Callister Estates, those are the two that will really shoot precinct <laughs> one up because they're both in, in, in that area. But um, I think that, I doubt that any of that is really going to be happening in the next five years or, or more. It'll probably <laughs> impact it definitely in the 2030s. Census, but, so. Mm -hmm. That's um, pretty much where we are now. So we basically have to decide whether we're going to, you know, accept the, the state's um, recommendations. And then what they do is they provide us with uh, uh, a boundary plan. And, uh, and then we just go ahead and then it, it goes into effect as of January. So. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have questions for I, me? Yeah, I do, if you, I may. Do you typically, when you do <coughs> redistricting like that, or for the precincts, is there usually a lot of pushback? Are people like committed to their their precinct? Or I would imagine the education piece is the biggest. Uh, you, you'll get a little bit of everything. Okay. There'll be a lot of people that will be excited to go back <coughs> to make one because that's where they were originally, you know. Um, you also get a lot of people that only vote every four years and they really don't remember where they voted the last time. So it's, it's anywhere in there. Okay, so it's not but, a huge impact. Okay. But it's, it's you know, and, and the other thing is, is we're, we're close, you know, the precincts are close so that if they're in the wrong one, it's, it's basically just sending them across the street. So, and it won't have an impact if it's vote by mail other than how we handle it, you know, internally. So. Thank you. You're and thanks for reaching out to Dave to try to get the projections for the next kind of, because that was one of my questions, was I know that there's some expected growth even in the next kind of two to five years, so to make sure. Thank you. And I mean, and just in A and R lots, I mean, that's what we see come through our office now. That, and I think that <coughs> there's a potential for that in both one and two. I, I don't really see much more happening in three, but that way, but you never know. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions for Anita? All right, thank you. We appreciate you coming. And Dan walks in, so oh, just in time. Perfect timing. Voter buddy Sorry, I'm running a little late. That's okay. Anita just finished, so good timing. So I was listening. Oh. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt. That's all yours. How's everybody doing? Great. Good. Um, I do have some forms, some um, requests for transfer forms, which have been done for quite some time, but um, I don't know where they've been. We, they haven't come back to me, so I'm going to give them back to you again. Okay, are these the whole set of them for the different transfers? Yeah. So I don't need these go out to every. We can. Yeah. All right. This has got to go on both the Slickman's agenda and the Finance Committee agenda. Correct. So these are the updated ones, Dan. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Those are clean up the loose ends at year end. Most of it, snow and ice deficit that we agreed we would try to fund from existing appropriations. Um, that's the largest piece of that uh, in those transfers. So Mr. Chairman, just to, to understand what's going on, so Dan did give me a set of older transfers to close out the year. We recently talked about it, he said he was going to give me a new batch. This is the new batch. So what will happen is we'll give this to Beth to schedule for a board selectors meeting. We'll see that we get it to you for the finance committee as well so that both committees get vote on the transfers, okay? okay. So Becky and I were going to do a joint presentation on the financial <laughs> outlook of the town, but Becky's not feeling well. Um, so I'll just give you a little, um, some highlights. I, I don't have a, and I never predict free cash. Um, there's too many variables that the state takes into account. Um, I've done that in the past and to my detriment. <coughs> so, but I will tell you there's a little over $300,000 coming back from general fund appropriations. Um, which is good. It's about 1.2% of our total budget. 
Um, and surprisingly, about $150,000 over what we projected for motor vehicle excise. Wow. I'm not sure where people are finding cars with this <laughs> chip <laughs> crisis that we have. Um, but that's good news. Um, looks like building permits, and, and we all know that you know building is still strong here in Rutland, so um, that is coming in over budget. Um, so we have some positive numbers that are affecting our <coughs> year-end free cash. Um, and that, that number will be, of course, forthcoming. As soon as I have a better projection um, from the state, I will, of course, inform Ron and he will inform you. And mm -hmm. You haven't gotten any kind of input as to whether there's going to be extensive delays to getting free cash or anything? <coughs> getting I don't think so. I've heard some issues maybe with getting um, recaps out there, but um, I haven't heard of any delays in the free cash process. We're having a skeptic. Karen's telling us they have a special town meeting in February. February. <laughs> Dan's always optimistic. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You're sitting in the wrong seat. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a realist. <laughs> Not like you can read your Becky, Becky and I will come back and do a full, you know, kind of fi financial presentation and outlook. Yeah, so because we're, we're at that time of year trying to think about special town meeting and yeah. obviously don't want to do it too early if we know there's not going to be numbers to work with. So. Yeah, I don't anticipate a, 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 you know, a long delay. Um, you know, I would think somewhere in that November time frame. Of course, we want to have it done so we can get the recap wrapped up and get the bills up before December 31st. Mr. Chairman, with that note, we gave two dates that we did, and needed to talk about Maybe Dan can answer the question if those dates are appropriate for town meeting. And yeah, we, those were just like random examples. Is that what you're saying as far as timing? Yeah, or, I yeah. mean, we. The, I think the first day was was um, probably too early, but I just wanted to basically show <coughs> the the timeline of when you would have to open the warrant. To open and if close you, the, yes. Yeah. So that if you did, um, the second date I think was the. I just picked a Thursday because it seems like it's been on a Thursday the last couple of years, and I um, and then so then I think it was the weekend before Thanksgiving, so um, but there's nothing that says we, we can't do it in, in in December. It's just good to get it scheduled. So sure. Dan, we'll we'll kick out those dates again for you. Yeah. And just <coughs> case if you approve of either of those dates or if you recommend something <coughs> else, so we can start locking down the date. Yeah, I think to be on the safe side, I think that week before Thanksgiving is probably a the earliest. Yes, that would be the date to shoot for it. Yeah. I think that's what we looked for last year and then we had to push it. Well that that was a that was <laughs> a whole there was a whole lot of things going problem. on. So. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah. That was a delay that, you know <coughs> you know, state induced. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't we, we won't have those issues this year. Well, not those issues. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying there might not be another issue. We won't have those. Don't jinx us, Karen. <laughs> yeah, don't you? Does anybody have any questions for Dan? Dan, just one comment, if I could, Mr. Chairman. You gave me a hard copy of the articles um, that you thought could be adjusted. The chairman said to me something about a Ford 150 truck or a truck that wasn't on my list. That somehow you got on his list. Do you, do you know what that is? The one with the plow equipment that hadn't been purchased. <coughs> it was Article 21. That didn't show up on my hard copy unless I, I somehow missed it, but I didn't think I got it on my hard copy. Yeah, that was a, the, the F-250? Yes. Yeah, that, that had 1,336.50 left. Um, you know, that was a November of 19 article. I, you know, I think it's substantially complete at this point. Okay. Wasn't that for plow equipment, though? For the, for the uh, well, it was the, the entire, you know, Ford F-150 plus. Um, yeah. Dan, if we could just send me that one because I can check with Joe just to make yeah. sure that's clear. Because yeah, for some reason that's not one that was on yeah. the list. There's one thousand three thirty six <laughs> fifty left from that original article. Okay. Uh, but it does go back a little ways. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when those articles you know, are deemed substantially complete, they, they roll back out to free cash. Thank you. Anybody have anything else? 
Thanks for all your work, Dan. You're, keeping you're us. welcome. Yeah. Yeah, it was great Thanks to see everybody. And, you know, Becky and I will be back. Um, give you the good news. All right. Free cash. Good news. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. <coughs> Uh, town Administrator update? Yes, yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, in your books on the Town Administrator update, I, I want to talk about this. I know I gave you uh, the update because I thought it was important you get the update in a timely manner, but I do want to speak a little bit about it tonight because I think this will be a particular interest to the citizens of the town, so I think we should have a brief discussion about it at the very least. So about two years ago, uh, Joe Buckley started working uh, on the issue of a sewer line. Our main sewer line runs um, from Rutland through Holden all the way up to Upper Black Zone uh, where the sewage actually gets treated and of course citizens are assessed uh, based upon their share and their volume of water that goes through their, their houses um, and they've been assessed uh, for some time. Joe had some concerns two years ago that, that there seemed to be a problem with our lines and and he felt we were kind of being overcharged, but didn't have a way to, to demonstrate that. Uh, so within the last two years, Joe hired an engineering firm, and they looked at the whole issue. And it came to a resolution since I've been here in the last year, uh, where our engine, engineering company identified that uh, they believed we were being overcharged in terms of volume that was leaving Rutland to hold them. They, they, he believed that we were being overcharged. Uh, it took some time for DCR to review our engineers' recommendations and comments and hire their own engineering companies and go through their whole process. But the good news at the end of this is that uh, DCR themselves have come to the conclusion that we have been being overcharged uh, by up to 27%. So a significant overcharging as a result of the sewer line going through. Part of our problem is we don't know how long that occurred. We can prove that it occurred from the time that Joe did the engineering study and had the engineering company in there to determine it, which is sometime last year. But in fact, we could be being overcharged for three years. There's no way to verify and come to that number because it's kind of too late, right? So we have two issues that we've been talking with DCR and we've had in our state rep, our state senator, all kinds of state officials. Uh, we had a recent meeting to, to really uh, come to at least the conclusion that yes, in fact, we have been being overcharged. Uh, we've had the Massachusetts Water Resource Authority involved in this issue as well. So about, I want to say it's about two weeks now, we had the meeting and uh, we asked them for some documentation to make it clear that yes, we're being overcharged because the resolution, at least going forward, is to use a formula that adjusts our distribution by you know reducing it by 27 percent which is good news for these people who are on that sewer line because if they're going to see some kind of reduction to the rate we asked for a formal letter for that we hadn't gotten last two weeks joe sent a letter to them again today saying we want a formal letter to that so going forward we we think we're going to see a significant reduction in our sewer costs which is great news for people using the line then the question becomes what are they always backwards and that's much, much more complicated issue because we can only verify about a year back. In our meeting, the State Senator uh, Gobi, State Senator Gobi and Representative Ferguson uh, felt that it should go back longer than that. Uh, at least the time that Joe kind of started complaining that there was a problem here, but there's no verification. But the, the State Senator and State Representative have basically taken the position that DCR is wrong. It was their meter it was wrong. And the reason the meter is wrong I'm not the technical guy here, but for some reason, silt was sitting on top of the meter, effectively making the calculation wrong. The silt that sat on top of wherever the, I want to say it's a, a laser or something that measures it, was impacting it, and that's what caused there to be a problem. So DCR is saying they're going to come in and replace that measurement tool and fix that going forward. They're going to pay for all of that cost, so that's good news. So... They told us it's going to take at least three weeks or a month for our state senator, state rep, to meet with DCR and everybody else to try to figure out how we are going to get reimbursed backwards. So the problem with this is this, is that the total calculation goes like this, and I'm going to try to do this as easy as possible. So there's a Rutland total, and Rutland goes through, there's a meter at the end of Rutland, and it goes through to Holden, and then Holden measures their total, and they pay the difference between the Rutland meter 
in the Holden meter, right? So Rutland, or Holden, because the Rutland meter was too high by 27%, effectively, Holden was being undercharged for theirs because they're taking the, the total minus Rutland, that's what they had to pay, and that was more or less than what they should have been billed. That makes sense, everybody? So the, the question, so DCR says, well, Holden owes Rutland money. And Holden's going, wait a minute. <laughs> we budgeted this amount in our budget. We had no idea that you know we were being charged less than that. We have no ability financially to pay because it's not in our budget. We have no process for that. We didn't screw up the meter, DCR, you did, right? So the state legislative delegation agree with them. And frankly, to some degree, we all agree with them that DCR blew this and they, their measurement is what caused this, but Holden will benefit from this and it, it has benefited. Now going forward when the meter is fixed, Holden will have to pay an increased fee because now it will be more accurate. But should they have to pay backwards and Holden's going, there's no way we're paying backwards, right? So the long-term solution is how do we, how does Rutland get back its reimbursed money and from who? <laughs> So again, we can measure that for like a year, but we can't measure that prior to that. So right now that discussion is being had between our legislative delegation and DCR and NW, I think it's MWRA. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so we don't know what that resolution is gonna be. We've, we've said to them, we'd like one big check, not payments, but you know we don't know what that number is gonna be. Uh, what would have to happen is, is that the state legislature, I think would have to give money to DCR to refund us. We, we just don't know that funding mechanism and how it's going to work. Other than that, our legislative de delegation in DCR thinks we deserve reimbursement. Again, the state's kind of pointing at Holden. Holden's saying no. So there's some, some issues to be worked out here. And that's not going to be, that's going to be a longer term solution. I want to <coughs> really express my appreciation to Joe Buckley, who's been working on this two years. And while it's become fruitation last year, it was Joe starting this process back then that really helped us. So, all of this is, I guess, going forward, good news to, to sewer repairs that it's going to be less. Bad news is they've been over, being overcharged for quite some time, right? Mm -hmm. So it was a kind of a good and bad way to look at it. But I, the reason I wanted to talk about it, I gave a memo this week to the uh, members of the select board. <coughs> they don't know about this, but I think the public needs to know a little bit about this. And it, the town has been actively engaged in, with the selectman support to actually look at this issue and find out what's going on. So the board deserves some recognition of, of the fact that they've been supporting and encouraging us to get to the bottom of this. Um, so I did, Mr. Chairman, I think it's important that we get that out and we will, once we hear more from DCR and our legislative delegation, we'll continue at the table and try to negotiate what we feel is the best solution we can get. And as of right now, we just don't know what that is, but but um, we will do our best to get as much benefit to Rutland sewer rate payers as we can, okay? Any questions on that before I move to some of my other issues? I think that's a really important issue, so. Okay. I, sorry, I have Tip. a question. Would that <coughs> be looking at um, reduced rates for all all current rate pay for all current rate payers? Is that how that kind so of So that's what I think our expectation is. Once it's lowered by twenty seven percent, then the rates could be adjusted. How much that is and how that plays out, I just don't know, Leah, until we get to that point. But we're waiting for that 27% reduction first, and then we can start talking about how that impacts our rate payers. <clears throat> you know, it could be maybe some part of that goes back to rate payers, a little bit lower rate, or it could go into rate trained earnings to fix sewers. It could, there's a lot of different ways you can do that money. I don't think we've, we've got to get the money before we can make those decisions. Make sense? Mm -hmm. um, the second issue I had in a meeting today, myself, Mike Moriarty, went out with uh, representatives of the junior Woosocks and, and uh, select member, uh, let's say his name right, which city, mm -hmm. uh, talked to me about this some time ago that they had approached the town looking for potential uh, locations for fields in Rutland. Uh, we had spent some time in the, kudos to the police chief and Mike, we went on the GAS system and we looked at all available town pieces of property that might potentially be used from baseball fields. There are two properties that they're right now, as of today, they're still looking at. One is the Heist property, what is known as Parcel C. You remember A was the parcel where the houses, uh, the elderly housing is being built. B is kind of the front part. If you were looking at Maple Avenue, if you were looking straight on, to the left is what I refer to as Parcel B. I think to the right is Parcel C. Uh, parcel C is approximately seven acres. 
Uh, they like that site. It's relatively flat. Uh, right now, that's town owned and in control of the RDIC. But they're looking to build two large fields, and within those, each of those large fields is two smaller fields. Their goal is to do uh, to have it be a sort of a baseball training facility for young people up until I think the age of 18, and to have tournaments. And they also would consider working with the schools in the town to utilize their fields for tournaments. There's um, a couple of fields on that school road um, that goes down past Central Tree and in, in the Quad. Uh, they have fields there, and if you look at those fields, they're not in the best of condition. So they might work with the town to upgrade those fields and maintain those fields better as part of a package. But the overriding goal is to uh, make our town sort of a destination for baseball. Uh, and they're, again, they're affiliated obviously with the Wolf Sox. Uh, that's one location, and there's a lot of questions about, you know, is our if, if is uh, the RDIC even willing to put that back up as an RFP for, RFP for that project or not? The secondary piece was an interesting piece that I learned about mostly in the last couple of days. Uh, it's a piece of property that you guys are probably a lot more familiar with me, but it's on um, Central Tree Road. It's a large field. If you get on Central Tree, it's on the left, and there's a small utility substation or something there. But it's again about eight acres of property and the town must have an agreement for somebody to hay it because it's being hayed by somebody. But that's a very nice piece of property. That's level flat, potential for a ball field there as well. A little bit more complicated, it's a watershed protection area for the reservoir. Um, it is where I guess some of the solar fields were gonna go. That was, they set up Wheeler Road and it kind of connects to that property, is that wrong? Originally they did, but then they changed it to the top of Wheeler Road. Okay. So anyway, the, the question here is, is, and if you ask Joe Buckley, I'm sure he would say no immediately because he wants to protect your reservoir at all costs. But generally, this does not, passive recreation often can be put in these areas, but it would have to be a decision of the Conservation Commission if they were even willing to go down that path. But those are the two parcels that they're looking at. It's a long way from going anywhere. Obviously, as you know, under procurement law, we would have to put out an RFP and go through an extensive project. But uh, I think it, the concept of having uh, the junior woods next here could be exciting. It could bring in tourism, could bring in uh, people. Downside of any kind of activity is more traffic and some noise. Uh, so, so that's something that the Board of Selectmen, if we get down to that path, uh, I expect at some point they may come to you for some kind of presentation. presentation. And the same is true with RDIC for the Heights property, uh, to come and tell, see if you're interested in going down this path or not. Uh, it's a mixed bag. It has a lot of good things to it, and again, noise and traffic are not a good thing, so uh, it's something for the public will have to consider. Any so, so they give you some kind of a time frame of when they would really need to be? I think he's, the, the, he, the gentleman here has a lot of other towns that are interested in this. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, he wants to come to Rutland. And Maybe for any, well, for, of course. Well, of course <laughs> he wants to come to Rutland. But he, has, he, he likes Rutland else? for a variety of reasons, the demographics, the location of Worcester. So he really likes Worcester. Uh, uh, Rutland. So he's looking at it seriously. I would expect that he's going to be, I told him today, you need to put together some kind of presentation to convince the Board of Selectmen and RDIC that this is a good proposal. Because uh, there's other use for this property. There's potential other uses for, for instance, the RDIC property to be used for an urgent care or health care facilities. That elderly complex is going to make that a more valuable piece of property for a lot of different things. So it's just as one of the kind of things that you would have to consider in that proposal. But I think it's good. I think the answer to your question, Mr. Chairman, is they're going to act quickly, but they didn't give me any kind of schedule because he wants to move forward fast. Any other questions? Okay, the comment on Truck Festival, uh, I think it went extremely well. I was really pleased uh, to be there. I know a number of selectmen had popped in and were there. Um, I'll say this, the organizers did a phenomenal job. I was really concerned about the wetness of the field. The field actually turns out it drains very well, so it turned out to be good. The public, I think, had a great time. Uh, the organizer did, I think, a great job in making sure that the trucks and stuff went on the field uh, and didn't damage the field and stuff. So overall, I think it was a successful event that was well run. And uh, it just, you know, these events, I think they add to the community spirit and the community feeling of, of enjoying living in town. And these are the kind of events that make it nice. So I think the public really appreciated that. Okay, one last comment. And I'm not, I want to specifically not get too detailed, detailed into this, but I wanted to inform you because it's raised concerns with me. 
and I'm not sure quite yet how to address it. But I'm informed of a property that about five years ago, the owner of the property and the developer connected to the town sewer line. And there was some question, and it's in your packet of information. Again, I don't want to talk about names or any of the details of this yet. But the, the person connected into the sewer line and was closing off their own personal septic system. And the Board of Health has a forum where they, it looks like they applied, but there's no signature of our health agent saying he signed on off it being done. This is, again, five years ago, so the memories are, are not so clear as to was it ever signed off or not. Uh, I've asked them to look for the money, the, the fee for it, to see if we can track it down through the fee process. The DPW director I was in, and you have in your packet, a letter from the DPW director at the time saying that they connected legally and they couldn't do that and they had to stop and a lot of different things. And again, I got a document that shows that they have, it looked like they kind of filed or at least wrote the paperwork out, but no signature from the DPW director at the time. So I asked Mr. Buckley to call the former DPW director, and he seems to recall that in, at some time after that illegal hookup, they did connect. And again, I'm trying to track it backwards through the fee because we don't have any records of that. At the time, there was a meter installed on the well because I guess the way septic is traced is through the amount of water that goes through the system. Mm -hmm. And in looking at that issue, the meter was put on, but the person who had this connection did not, has not paid sewer fees for like five years. But they've been connected to the sewer line. So Mr. Buckley informed me that going forward, we're going to charge that person for the sewer going through this year. And the question I'm struggling with is, what about the four years that they didn't pay? So at least in my mind, there's a question of, in my mind, a simple question of fairness. That, you know, other their sewer holders effectively pay this person to be free. But then the secondary question is, did we ever send them a bill? And we think the answer to that is no. So back four years ago or five years ago, our DPW did not follow through and set them up on the payment plan. So I, I did email the town attorney today saying, if we don't bill them people for four or five years, do they have responsibility to pay? How does that work? And I haven't gotten the answer yet. That's why I don't want to talk about the details of all this tonight, but I wanted you to know that, and the reason I want you to know this is this, because there are a number of people that know that this person, and this person knows that she's going to start being billed this year. I'm sure she's not happy about it, but I'd be very happy I didn't get billed for the last four years. And I, I had this question in my own head about should they pay or not four years backwards. So before it came out in some other way, I wanted you guys to know that we're exploring this issue and trying to figure out how to move forward what are the legal obligation of the person? I know that on a house, if you didn't pay your taxes and you didn't get a bill, you're still obligated to pay the taxes because you knew mm -hmm. you should have paid the taxes. And that's a requirement of state law. I don't know for sure if that's the same as it relates to a sewer charge. So, so I need to do some more homework to get this more detailed. Uh, but I at least wanted you to give you the gist of the problem so that if it pops up, you're aware that it's being looked at, okay? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Jeff has his hand up. Jeff, you have a question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm very surprised to hear this, and a little bit as a uh, sewer rate payer who pays three to $500 per billing cycle, uh, up to $2,000 per year. We're looking at possible theft of from what I hear of you know eight to ten thousand dollars from the town, could you please include that in the process of uh, if there was a criminal act? So, Jeff, uh, I want the, the part of the reason I'm sorry, I'm going to stop you here. I don't even want to use that term because I don't know if that's true or not. So, I don't want to get into those types of terms until I've had a chance to have legal review of it. Um, the fact that we didn't bill may have some impact on that, but I, I just want to be cautious. And that's why I want to be very cautious of how we say things because I don't know that that is a fair interpretation yet. But clearly the person was not billed, and let's let's kind of leave it at that, and in our opinion that that's wrong. Okay, as long as you're looking into it with the uh, town council, it's yep. very concerning as a rate payer myself because we pay a lot. Yep. I Thanks for that update. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. 
Anything else? That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. I hope it was informative. Does anybody have any questions for Ron? Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, we're on to new business. Discussion and possible action on Smithsonian traveling exhibit, Crossroads, Changes in Rural America. Sheila, you're going to present that? Are you? <laughs> I can. Okay. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Are, are you? Were you I, be? I'm here to answer questions. Uh, we were asked by uh, the town planner to take the lead on putting in an application, so I'm happy to... Do whatever you'd like. Yeah, so so just to kind of... <laughs> Sorry, I didn't put... I think she was... No, I, think I actually think it, she is going to kind of get a lead on this, but I okay. just want to talk about it. <laughs> so a number of people, including David George, our town planner, Sheila and others, uh, brought forward this issue as something that they wanted to seriously consider, especially with our 300th year anniversary coming up. Um, and thanks to Sheila for kind of taking the lead on this and looking at this. Uh, a big issue was the location of this exhibit and could it be in a secure... Thing and Sheila has worked with the library director, and I'm told the library director is on board for this and thinks it's a great idea. So I think that that's home run in itself. There's a ten thousand dollar grant that comes with this, but there's a bunch of requirements. There's so developing programs and stuff with there, and there's a ten thousand dollar match that goes along. But that match could be like, for instance, using the library staff, a lot of things. So I think Sheila and others are comfortable that we can make that match uh, because it's not a dollar for dollar kind of match. It's more of a providing services. So one of the things that Sheila did, and, and I think it's part of the grant process, this is a competitive grant. I think it's only one of six communities throughout the state that's going to have this opportunity. Um, so Sheila, uh, through the 300th Anniversary Committee, asked a number of us to provide letters of support. I know I sent mine to her today. David George sent his to her today. I don't know, Mr. Chairman, if the board would like to do that as well, if you're in support of this concept. Uh, but it seems that, you know, the, this, truthfully, my comment to Sheila was, this looks like a lot of work. Are you guys up to this? And she assures me that uh, that she's comfortable taking the lead and that they can do this. And of course, Carrie's going to play a big part in the library for this, so it's not like she's going to be by herself. And she'll have support from me and others, David, to, as it moves forward. Uh, but I think it, I think it's something. The concept behind this, I think, is to kind of get small towns involved in in education and communication and bringing people together. This, as I read the documents, it's really a it's designed specifically for the rural kind of town and to get them to think about their history, their current time, you know, and what their future is going to be. And with that, Sheila, I hope I didn't steal all your thunder, but that was kind of the gist of it as I understood the program. I don't know timelines or when this is supposed <laughs> to happen or any of that, Sheila, so maybe you can okay. kind of guide us along with all that. So the Smithsonian Institution has been doing this for many years. They have, over the years, covered all 50 states. This particular exhibition, which is part of their larger program called Museum on Main Street, is called Crossroads Change in Rural America. Um, it's in year four to five of a six-year traveling process. It is headed to the New England states for the first time. and. Um, as Ron mentioned, there it's it's being uh, led, by the way, by Mass Humanities. And Mass Humanities is taking the lead on the application process, which is essentially a letter of intent. Uh, they will be choosing from communities <coughs> under 12,000 uh, in the state, which is roughly about 200 communities that are eligible, are going to choose six to be hosts for a six-week exhibition, which was exactly why Carrie and the trustees were so imperative it, for us to even consider this. If the library wasn't on board, there was no other location to do this. They're not looking for an expansive location. It was about 750 square feet, but it did need to be lock and key. It's not something you can leave outside. Um, I've described it to a few people as being similar to a scholastic book fair. Uh, that's going a little far. It comes in on 16 rolling cases and gets set up. Um, there, the LOI itself is a little bit extensive, uh, and a few of us have a working document right now on Google. If anybody wants to be added to that as a contributor, editor, commenter, please let me know, because the timeline, as Ron noted, is very short. We were notified this of this last week. The deadline was this Friday. It has been actually extended to Monday. I'm not sure why, but yay us. Uh, we reached out and did ask for letters of support from quite a few um, organizations and people, including Kim Ferguson and Ann Gobi, of course. We're hoping for some letters, even though the short turnaround, I know it can be very difficult with their schedules. Uh, we're also looking to try to do some photographs of the property, which they're very interested in. As Ron noted, this is competitive, and it may very well come down to the description of why we think we are a good fit. Um, 
and they also want to know how we're going to work partnerships in. And of course, one of the core, the core missions of 300th <coughs> is to try to collaborate with and lift up as many of our local committees, commissions, nonprofits, and other organizations as we can. Uh, we've already had a brief discussion with a couple members of the Rutland AgCom, who I think are integral to this. Um, moving forward, one of the essays that we need to answer is what kind of programs we're going to be bringing. That will be our piece of kind of earning our keep of being able and willing to take on this six-week exhibit. Um, I think it would be fascinating for us to get our local farmers in for a panel discussion to talk about their view of changes in rural America. Yeah. If there was ever an example of how farms have either gone by the wayside or changed with the times, it's the farms in Rutland, one of whom has, as we know, the first digester in the state, anaerobic digester, uh, farms that are recreating themselves into venues for uh, public events. Uh, so I think we are a perfect fit. Um, and I have to say, you know, with Scott Gilroy sitting here, we will be adding to the fact that Rutland and this particular location was able to move through on big days, more than 900 people through this <coughs> building. We did it comfortably. We did it with uh, adequate handicapped access. We did it with adequate parking. We had people from all over the state, many of whom were, if not from the area, somewhere close and had never been in our town. And now they were already aware of it. I do think that gives us a leg up. Um, I think the fact that Carrie and the library were willing to provide us with this location uh, should be a linchpin for this. We are very interested in hearing about any other things you might have in mind. Certainly we've reached out to the schools as well. We've already heard from uh, the principal at Central Tree, Dave Cornacchioli, who of course has very deep roots in the community himself. Uh, two out of our three schools would be able to walk to this exhibition uh, and get some special time in. That could certainly be one of our programs as well. We can do interactive packets with them. So. Uh, such a feather in our cap if we can win this. Um, it's absolutely doable. As Ron noted, $10,000 grant will cover costs of transporting it, costs of staffing it, costs of marketing it to a point. Our in-kind costs will be taken care of by the value of the building, um, uh, HVAC costs, things like that. Uh, some, I'm sure we will need a little bit of in-kind assistance at times. Uh, you know, And then we'll do a lot with volunteers. Most of these other communities have enlisted volunteers to help staff the, uh, the exhibit itself. So what, what time, like what dates are they looking at that this would be occurring? And, and what exactly, how do they use the space? Is it the whole <coughs> library? The downstairs nope. Downstairs? Uh, so they want 750 square feet. So what we uh, discussed with Carrie briefly was the use of the large room. So this will book up that large room for six weeks straight. We, as part of the application, are allowed to give our top three choices. Those choices start with a six-week stint that begins on September 10th. Um, this is going to get decided in October relative to which six communities get chosen. There are then training sessions, uh, just one day apiece in February and March, and then you have the summer to kind of prepare yourself and start the marketing. Um, after that September six week period, we are not going to apply for the next one because it would affect the Festival of Trees, which that, we that was my concern. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we're going to skip that one. We will move on at that point. The remainder of the four exhibition possibilities are in 2023. Is it ideal for the tricentennial? No, but again, it's such an amazing opportunity for the town. We'll be happy to get anything, but we will put September as our first choice. And not to put it down on like, what if there's an uptick in COVID and we can't, you know, how is there is there some kind of a backup plan for that? Or? There is no question that the Smithsonian Institution has had to readjust over the past 18 months with some of their exhibitions. They've had to move some, they've had to shorten some, they've had to cancel some. And I think moving forward, just like we're doing with everything else, if we have to make adjustments for COVID, if we have to shorten hours, uh, or if we end up having to shorten the exhibit completely and, and move it on to the next location. We, we certainly saw that. And I feel terrible for the communities that must have done all this work and then and then lost that shot. Right, but yeah, I mean, I know that they were getting a grant for them to set up and break down. Mm -hmm. So if we had to break it down and yeah. do it, that they're fine with that? Without yes. any kind of, there's no commitment to us to do anything? No, to, it's not a situation where it's a for-profit entity and we would be penalized in some way right. if it were canceled. Um, so if... I'm trying to think of some situation where, say, if Rutland couldn't do it, but some other community could do it, it's very possible that maybe they have communities waiting in the wings who were, you know, seventh on the list of six, and they'll yeah. reach out to them and say, we're, we're going to try to move this. We saw, um, if you look, and I'm sure Ron can forward the email that I sent earlier today, uh, there's a YouTube video, there's um, a 
set of, of requirements and presentation suggestions. If you look at the past several years worth of uh, the different um, ex exhibits all over the country, we absolutely saw that some of them had been moved, some of them had to be readjusted. So mm -hmm. now we'll have to work with it. Mr. Chair, just a couple of compliments here. The, you know, I got to tell you, it wasn't all that long ago where we didn't have a 300th anniversary committee. You guys asked me to kind of reestablish it. I think that this committee is taking on a very aggressive approach to developing uh, <laughs> events, uh, which is pretty amazing. And, and I want to give kudos to uh, the gentleman of the Food Truck Festival who not only did he host and do a good job in organizing it, but he provided and allowed it the 300th anniversary committee use it as a, a way to raise money. I think you did pretty damn well from what I saw. Uh, yeah. Sheila was pretty aggressive in greeting people at the door and contributions, no. contributions were coming in pretty well. I thought she did a great job. Yeah, I really, frankly, I think she did a good job. And quite frankly, you need a leader there to, to really move and push things and get things done. So that was nice. Also, a quick compliment to, you know, we, we set up the town hall parking lot. You might have seen if you were there. We closed it off for handicapped parking. And while we only had a few handicapped people, we had way more space than we needed. I think it was great for those people that were handicapped that they didn't have to worry about parking. They were able to get in. And I thought that was terrific. So um, kudos to all the 300th anniversary committees. There were a number of people who worked there. Um, and overall, I think that the Nut event was a success for what I think you talked about earlier, partnerships. The partnerships between the town and the 300th anniversary committee, I think, was a real good thing. And even with the... the uh, Fire brigade with a bear tent. I think it was. It all worked out pretty smoothly. All right. Thank you. Does uh, Does anybody have? I. Further questions? I don't have <coughs> questions. I love the idea of this. I think it's such a phenomenal opportunity, and like my brain is just going crazy with how awesome it could be, and especially with, with the schools and everything tied in. I mean, <coughs> what an amazing opportunity it would be for. Rutland for any community to get it, but especially Rutland. And I feel like, you know, it says here it's Crossroads. The exhibit is um, main, the first museum on Main Street exhibit, Crossroads Change in Rural America. Um, and to create programs aimed at sparking conversations about the past, present, and futures of their future of their towns. And I think just where we are with the tricentennial, with the master plan, with kind of everything that has been going on in town, there's a lot of this conversation already happening, and I think it's such a cool opportunity to kind of do something fun with all of that also. So I'm, I would be super psyched, and I fully support it. And I would be willing to either write a letter individually or on behalf of the board, or if the board would like to write a letter of support, I think mm -hmm. that would speak volumes. So. If you're going to do it, you need to do it quick because the timeline is really fast. Do you want to make a recommendation that the board send a letter of support? Sure, I'll make a motion that the board uh, quickly draft and send a letter of recommendation um, in favor of supporting the Museum on Main Street application. Um, with to the do I need to say who it's to the 300th committee? Uh, geez, that's fine. I think that's sufficient. Just, the, just if you the recommendation, if you forward the text of the letter to me, I'll put it on. Stuff and stationery and, and ship it to Sheila. So just send me your text. I'll just copy and paste it right into the select. Yeah, they're all pretty standard usually to support letters. Yeah. Um, do I have a second? Second. Okay, any other discussion? So, uh, roll call. Benoit I. Whiteman I. And Nichols I. Okay. And thank you guys so much. I mean, the 300th committee has been doing a ton <coughs> recently. Um, the concerts on the common and this and just kind of that community involvement piece. So thank you guys for everything it's a yeah. lot of work and you guys are busting your butts for it so thank you uh, I echo that yeah having the concerts on the comms <coughs> is really nice to keep activity going oh, in town so. yeah. Jeff oh, we don't want to talk to Jeff okay <laughs> <laughs> Jeff you had a comment yes don't want to talk to me <laughs> <laughs> I forgot there are mics everywhere okay. <laughs> uh, I just want to just wanted to met Jeff Stillings lonely just wanted to uh, comment on behalf of the Historical Commission. We also discussed this opportunity at our last meeting uh, within the week, and uh, unanimously overwhelming also support the uh, Smithsonian traveling uh, show in there. So, just for the record, the Historical Commission is 100% on board, also. Yeah, and like as long as, long as Carrie's on board and, and she's fine with the building, which would be my <coughs> biggest concern, that's great. So. And I could see that she would be. So. All right. Does anybody else have any comments or questions? 
All right. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Let's see. What do we have next? Did, did you need to take something out of order, Phil? No. Okay. Um, so, I'm sorry. So the next up is um, updates on the bylaws from the ad hoc committee for the inclusion for the town meeting, which we don't know when it will be. <laughs> sure enough. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I know you all know me, but for those of you in TV land, I'm Peter Crane. I'm chair of the ad hoc bylaw committee. Um, and I'm here to talk today about, number one, the status of the uh, uh, Committee status and where we are in the reviews. Number two, a brief uh, discussion about the reorganization of the bylaws that we went through. And number three, to propose a path forward between the bylaw committee and the select board. I'm not here to talk about specific bylaw content, just to give overviews. Where is the committee? Well, we have uh, eight chapters of bylaws. Six of them we have completed review. We've done some of chapter seven and eight. We have a total of six bylaws left to review. They are biggies and complicated ones, which we purposely left to the side until just because. But we have we have confidence that we can get through them with supposed haste. It's not <clears throat> it is unlikely with our review, select board review, and legal review, and other people's review that uh, we would make it to this annual. But I can't say we won't, but I'll say I just doesn't feel likely. We will need to have a discussion in the future about how it's how we're going to present them at town meeting and when we're going to present them at town meeting, but that's not for tonight. Uh, number two, so there was a reorganization recently. Uh, you have in your packets, I'm not going to show them to everyone, but, uh, the two tables of contents, the old and the new. And really, there isn't a huge difference, but there are some really inter interesting subtleties. Uh, we discovered that w the original rules were after we created chapters, every bylaw was placed in the sequence that was passed by town meeting. Well, that's great for a historical document, but it really creates a really horrific flow to the bylaws. Uh, when you have a place where you talk about how committees are formed, in a by if four committees, four bylaws later than the place where you begin discussing committee, it doesn't flow well. So we completely we uh, looked at everything and we reorganized them. Uh, the biggest change is that we reorganized legal affairs to be the town council bylaw and what we called prohibitive bylaws, public drinking and unregistered motor vehicles, things of that nature. We sort of grouped those together. The other chapters stayed fairly well intact. Uh, and then we started to, we tried to pick the best flow for the bylaws. So in general, it's town officers and officials and offices, and then it's committees, and then it's everything else, and the everything else is usually in, uh, in alphabetical order by title. So that's where we're going. As I said, you can see what the what the what the two sequences are now. Uh, what that did do with respect to the select board review that we had started last year. Now I know we started a very long time ago, and we were getting ready to really ramp up more. And then town meeting happened, and then then town meeting got delayed, and we never really got back to it. Um, so. To, <clears throat> Bring it back, there are a couple bylaws that have been moved into chapters one and two that this committee needs to review. I would ask the, the select board if you are interested in reviewing anything you've already seen in the past, because now's the time if you're going to. Uh, in fact, uh, in order to make it move forward, I am going to propose some hard work. I'm going to propose that we take an off Monday once a month and have a joint meeting between the ad hoc bylaw committee and the select board to do the review that this board said it wanted to do before we pass things off further down the chain. Um, and I kind of like the committee, the, the select board's input on that. <laughs> I would also, by the way, propose that instead of saying we're going to do chapter three, we're going to do chapter four, that we set a time limit of two hours to say, we're going to start where we start, we're going to end where we end every night. We know the, we know the list sequence when we go through them, but rather than trying to force our way through some very, very long bylaws, 
and when you get towards the end, they are very long and very complicated. Uh, I would suggest, as I said, that we place a two-hour time limit on a meeting like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, that seems seems like a good idea to do. That. And then we could just post that we're starting here for the next meeting. Right, we and get, we're starting. Right, we yeah. get, well, we get done. We get done in the two hours. I'm just thinking if there's anyone that's interested in watching or anything mm -hmm. that they kind of can at least guesstimate where we might be or whatever. Right. The one thing I would question, I, I do know yes. that the Finance Committee had a lot of, they had reviewed the changes and stuff like that. Are you going to meet with them and discuss uh, at all? The Chair and I just agreed to September 30th. Okay, great. I appreciate that. <coughs> and the other thing I had a question, because the Planning Board meeting, they had a lot of questions regarding um, at-home businesses and the by Does that fall into these bylaws? It does not. We do only general bylaws. That is and under zoning, zoning bylaws. Well, so that's <coughs> the zoning bylaw. Okay. And that is, that is entirely under Planning Board's authority and not mm -hmm. under... Any other I just community. knew they were talking about upgrading the bylaw, and I just yeah. wanted to make sure who was okay. Does anybody have any other questions? So we're going to do it once a month. <coughs> month That's, that would be Monday. my suggestion. Yeah. yeah. So we'll start with um, the month coming up in the week anyway. So we'll figure out. All right. So we're going to meet September. Th I don't have the calendar. In front we of we meet. Um, do, I need, do we want to do it as quick as next Monday or just the following? Uh, I, I would actually suggest. Let's give everybody a little time because I'm going to be get passing you off the bylaws for right. review. So I want to give you enough time to review also. So I would think not next Monday, right. but that the would be following too yeah. off so Monday. Makes, so I two weeks from Monday sense. probably would be the best bet. Okay. So. And sure. that way, because I know you said you're going to meet with finance too, so that would, in case yes. we have any discussions on that. Too. Peter, if you would just work with Beth to make sure that they slap down and also provide the bylaws to Beth so you can give them to the board. I will absolutely do that. And we'll obviously post it as a joint, make sure we post it as a joint. So. Um. Now, finally, there is one other item on your agenda, which is the, the thing we'd like to take out of order, if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah, and what number are we on again? Do you know what number that is? It's the 196. Uh, one. 196. So, 196. So, does anybody have any objections to taking that out of order? No objections. Okay. All right. So when the Ad Hoc Bylaw Committee was formed, a lot of these many years ago now, uh, we were formed with seven members because we had seven people who showed interest. <laughs> and why turn someone down who's willing to do work for the town, especially this hard slogging work? Over the past couple of years, we have lost two members. In fact, it's been well, well, well over a year uh, since we lost Karen Greenwood. Uh, which, when she had her accident, she dropped out of that. And we had lost Lindsay Demers before that when she moved out of town. So we have been acting as, a, as effectively a five-member board, but our quorum is four because we are technically a seven-member board. So we, are, we don't think there's enough work left to, to concern ourselves with getting, to, to, to getting more members to take part in the board because we, all of our efforts in the past have not yielded any results. So we would ask the select board change us to change the ad hoc bylaw committee to be a five member board and the rest of the charge should remain the same. Does anybody have any questions or concerns? I mean I think when we said it it was very true what Peter said. We kind of there were seven people that were interested and we were going between doing a five or seven member board and there were seven qualified people that were interested, so that's why we set it at seven. Um, I can totally understand if things are kind of at the wrapping up phase to get one or two new people on board and up to speed and everything could be more time on the ad hoc committee's plate than just continuing through. So I don't feel strongly that we need to keep it as a seven, given where everything is, but I don't know if um, I know on some boards they have like, um, alternates, like alternates. I mean, is that something you would even want just in case for some reason anybody on the board ever was to leave or to? Uh, we would have that. I think we have the same problem anyway. If we haven't been able to attract. Yeah. A, uh, have you solicited recently or? Uh, it, yeah. It's been a while since we've done it, certainly. Okay. But I just thought that just gave you an option without having to, you know, we could still change the board, but you'd mm -hmm. always have an option if you wanted to have an alternate. But. Get to the board. Anybody else have any? <coughs> Do we get a motion to reorganize it? Do we, we can just make a motion, right, to reorganize the committee to a five-member? Yeah. Um, 
I'll make a motion to uh, reduce the ad hoc bylaw committee membership from seven down to five members and set their quorum as three then. Second. Second. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay, roll call. Benoit aye. Whiteman aye. And Nichols aye. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. All right. Thanks, Peter. Welcome. So, motion to appropriate no more than fifty thousand dollars of American Act funds money to continue funding the monitoring of ongoing COVID cases in the town of town by the board's contracted nurse. No, we had talked about this coming up. So, Mr. Chairman, just as you know, we have our committee uh, that recommendations makes recommendations to the board of selectmen on funding for the American Cares Act. Uh, this has come uh, before our committee, and uh, it was recommended unanimously to bring it to the board for consideration. Uh, obviously, it's a request from the Board of Health and the uh, the whole COVID team. I guess is the best way to describe it. With that, I will let the chairman of the Board of Health who uh, made a point to be here tonight to explain why this is an important issue. So, <clears throat> obviously pre-COVID, we've had the town nurse would have to, you know, go check on folks in town for any communicable diseases. And, you know, it, it was very small and the, the, the number was, you know, <coughs> not, the, the expense was nothing and it was part of the budget and it was not a big deal. <coughs> Come COVID, obviously the number has jumped. Um, you know, it, it was at a high last spring that was, you know, ridiculous. Um, and, and it's just, you know, at, as the cases come, it's the nurse's job to do all the, the contact tracing and, you know, checking back in, going to visit the, uh, the folks. So it's, um, it's, it's, it takes up a lot of hours. And that money was taken care of by, originally the CARES, I think, had a piece of it, and then we got the money from FEMA. Um, and as we know, you know, th those are going away. And there really is no, you know, way to pay for, for this out of our budget, um, the Board of Health's budget. Um, and, you know, it, it falls under all the, all the guidelines that we need to, to request of the, those monies. So we've said, you know, let's get it taken care of. You know, we, we put a pie in the sky number of 50 because if this continues for longer or it gets, you know, again, there's another, you know, bad winter or what have you, we're protected. If, it doesn't and you know it starts to slow down and you know it's the, the cases get less then we'll never take all of it you know but we just wanted to protect ourselves and make sure we had the monies to uh, pay the, the nurse um, for, for these uh, services that she's been doing all along. Um, I know that the Finance Committee was just kind of asking like how the, the, the amount is um, so how you arrive at the amount is you know what basically like so much we, a month and then she's just yeah we, on we call? took we took um, I believe it in forgive me for I think we took the the uh, the heat of the you know maybe last um, May to let's say August and we just averaged out the number per month and said okay if we're gonna get this bad of a dealing for the next eight months next twelve months this is what we would need so it's it's basically you know, worst case scenario, what we have paid her to, to take care of, uh, you know, the, the folks in past months where it was really bad, and we just put it all the way through, uh, through 2020, um, the end of the 2022. So it's like a, like a month, monthly stipend where she'll, she'll get that money, and then whatever she has to do, she has to do regardless of the hours? So, that how no, it's so she, she charges us an hour, an okay. hourly fee, and whatever she does, whether it's, again, going into the homes, checking on them, calling you know spending an hour a night calling and contact tracing or what have you and then she gives us a bill um at the end of the month for hours she spent and then we, we pay that bill okay so some months some months she may not charge that much another month oh god yeah that, that and again because, i mean it says, says 4500 a month so i was just kind of making sure yeah. exactly how you were that, how you that was worse that was the, the i said like an average of the worst four or five months in the past that we've had covid era um, and we just figured, you know, if it's going to be bad again, at least we'll cover it. Right. And if, if it isn't, it, it, it could be 300 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that 50000 quickly becomes 1700 over the time period. I mean, you know, we, we weren't sure. We just wanted to, you know, protect ourselves and then always come back less. Mm -hmm. And it, so, yeah, so if it's less and that, mo that money left over just gets kicked yeah. back. Yep, okay. exactly. <coughs> yep. I do have a question if that's okay. Um, so this, the date range is August 
of this year to June of next year. Correct. Are we yeah. in arrears paying her? No, or no, no. We're, we're, will we're, we need we're to good. make a transfer um, to make up for August, or how would this be? Well, when we were, when we first discussed this, it, I mean, I think we it was July when we first talked about it. So we we just kind of figured a date, and then we we gave that date range. So when when originally the, the funds were uh, out there, I think that I put this together in July. So basically, I was just covering August to June to cover you know the the remainder of this fiscal year, so we had the monies for it. Okay. So was your but, question like, how did she get paid in August? Get, yeah, well, where right now, we, we, we've, been, we've been good, and we've had the monies to pay it, but <coughs> the money's about gone. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. So we just need a, uh, to make a, a motion to approve, to approve it. Yeah. The, the, actually, I think the motion's in the letter. If you go to that yeah. section where she gave you that. Oh, yeah. The item, there's a page. motion in there we drafted for you. So I'll make the motion to allow the Rutland Board of Health to continue contact tracing of town residents that test positive for COVID-19 as outlined by Department of, health, of Public Health and to allow funds from the American Rescue Plan Act not to exceed $50,000 to cover such costs. Do we need the dates from? Yes, I would. Yeah. Yeah. Through August of 2022. Yeah, it, I mean, through well, June. Through of June, 20, yeah. Sorry, we'll through June. June. You don't have to find it. You don't have to, but that's fine if you wanted to find it. I don't think you want it to end for the fiscal year, right? Yep. Yeah. Well, that's in June 30th of the fiscal year, is what it would end, right? Is that? Yeah. Yeah, that's what we figured. That yeah. is through the fiscal year, yeah. and then so do you have that if we continue again, <laughs> it's something. I'll copy it from the Something else. Do we have to figure it goes longer, we have to come back? But that's, and that's and the intention. And also, to add into that, FEMA monies may come along and cover this down the road, but right. as of right now, we don't know. Yeah. Right. So we just need uh, an assurance that we, you know we can pay her to do the, the job that she needs to get done. Okay. It shows me it doesn't matter if we didn't use this American fund; we'd have to pay for it. We have to right. have it. So it's just a matter of this is funds we have that makes it easier yeah. for the right. town. And this yep. is the committee recommendation to right. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Any other discussion? I just was going to reiterate, I think it's really important work that we as a town can't go without. Yeah, so right. if we're going to have to pay for it somehow, I mean, I think we need to. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So roll call. The Noy died. Wait, and I. Nichols died. Right. Thanks, so. All right. Motion to ask the Board of Selectmen to add to the town meeting the designation of the following roads. Cloverdale Road, Ridge Road, Davis Road, Emerald Road, and Irish Lane as scenic roadways. Mr. Chairman. Yep. So this is an issue that came up prior to the last town meeting. And I specifically asked for it to be held. I, I talked to the chairman of the historical commission, which is still here. Okay. Uh, Peter is still here, and I talked to the Planning Commission and asked that uh, they have joint discussions on this because the Historical Commission brought it forward, and after reading some of the issues as to what it means to be a scenic road, there are concerns about what it will do to certain property owners on those streets, and then specifically dealing with things like trees that are within the, the, the first, whatever, 10 or 15 feet from the road and walls and different things. So uh, I asked them to meet about it, and frankly, it was hoping that the public would give some input because specifically the property owners that might be in, involved by it. Uh, I happened to bump into the chairman of the planning commission who said that the two committee meet, met and the planning commission made some recommendations to accept and move forward this bylaw. Mm -hmm. the, the only concern that I have at this point is I'm not sure I was told that there was nobody that attended the meeting. So mm -hmm. I hope that um, the residents who might be impacted this have had some chance to, to talk about this or were informed uh, if not, I hope that it's done before we get to town meeting that the, those people have at least know what's coming before them in town meeting. But uh, at this point, the Planning Commission has sent a letter uh, to recommend that this bylaw be added to uh, the town meeting uh, warrant. Um, and I think they have a, effectively a motion uh, in their packet that, that they're asking you to support. And that's um, to see if the town will vote to designate Cloverdale Road Ridge Road, Davis Street, Emerald Drive, and Irish Lane as scenic roads under MGL Chapter 40, Section 15C or take any action in relation therefore. And uh, I think that is what planning uh, and the historical commission have agreed upon. And with that, Mr. Chairman, if uh, either our representative from the planning commission or the chair, uh, he doesn't know he's a representative of the planning commission tonight, but the chairman of the historical 
uh, society would like to comment, or historical commission, I guess, right? Commission would like to comment, I think, would be appropriate. Okay. 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 Um, I, I guess I'll go ahead and I'll comment. Uh, we did meet uh, regarding the uh, uh, scenic roads by law with the uh, planning board probably, what was it, around the end of August, I believe it was. <coughs> Uh, there were a couple of recommendations that they made to us, just a couple of quick uh, revisions to the uh, significance of uh, the proposed scenic road designations. Uh, I think you might have that document. I don't know for sure because I'm not actually physically there. Uh, they mentioned, uh, what was it, uh, it's off Sasawana Road, technically not really an extension. So we doctored that, made that, revised that going up to the old Stevens farm rather than the Fales farm. Uh, and we also mentioned uh, the memorial bench to Joseph Stevens who died in a plane crash. Uh, for, let's see, I don't think there was anything else for any of the other roads that needed to be revised. And they recommended that we would attach um, uh, some snapshots of the GIS map uh, just to give the public an idea of which roads we were talking about in case they weren't sure. Uh, although I think if you live on that road, you probably know where it is and what it looks like, but uh, I, I would think it certainly wouldn't correct. And we voted for to, uh, as a commission, to make those revisions. Mr. Chairman, I just, I'm trying to see in the packet, I don't see the revisions in our packets. So oh. I, I, I read the, the article, Peter. Does that recommendation cover the revisions? Because I'm, I'm, I don't see anything. The Planning Commission letter came from David George. Okay. And I don't if, see any revisions unless I'm incorrect. If I may, I think the revisions were in the historical significance descriptions of the roadways yes. themselves. Yes. So. Um, right under the article. Line. Yeah, I right. see the historical things. I just want to make sure that do we have to change the motion to fit those. Um, well, I think the motion is just to, just to, place to recognize it those to allow streets. This is just streets. this is more just more specific. Okay. So I would think that this document would be updated before a town meeting, but that um, that our motion now is to basically allow it to be okay. placed for uh, article. So it's really just the information packet that goes with it. That's all. Okay. That's my understanding. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> I mean. Uh, are we just looking to support it, or are we going? Because we aren't we going to place all the articles. But your well, the recommendation you have would be to place this on the warrant. That's right. what they're going to do. We but can, but the warrant's have not to, open. Right. You don't that's have to. Not you can't, I was going to say you don't have to. Right. That's what I'm saying. So we can just well, say we support it, it when we place articles. We would place it right. Yeah. yeah. So there's no, I mean, really no right. no action other than that. No, just we want to notify you of it and make sure you knew that this was coming forward. Right. Does anybody have Peter? Peter Crennate's way. So I, I was at the planning board meeting and I did not speak then. Uh, I had a, I knew something was troubling me and it took me a few days to figure it out. This is a scenic road bylaw, not an historic road bylaw, and the vast majority of justification is purely historical and not scenic. The bylaw says to protect the scenic quality and character of certain town roads, etc., etc., etc. There's nothing in there about historical attributes being a protected class. I mean, I see where you're coming from, but I mean, I think they kind of go one and you know one without the other. I mean, historic makes it more, you know, it's more of interest. So people want to drive through it because it has significance. So I don't know how sp specific that goes, but I mean, I could see the tie to historic. But how else? I mean, scenic. What is it? What because they have pretty trees? I mean, how do you define that? I mean. That's fairly. That that's a, a fair point, but it's still. But like one twenty two is, is a scenic highway. I mean, I, I live off of it, but I don't. You know, because it's nice. It goes by state parks and things. But I, 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 how do they define it any more than that? So I don't think that the significant, the the historic significance adds to it. But how else will you define? I mean, how else how, would would they be defining these these highways? It's a criteria for a 
Scenic. Right. What, what so are they the looking for more I, than that? I can't tell you what the criteria for a scenic byway from the state is. I haven't looked yeah. at that at all. In fact, somebody else in this room may be able to. Right. I don't know. Well, I mean, because the it discussion did go to the planning board, so I mean. Lost villages for the 122. Yeah. And that's historic, really. That's historic. Right. That's why it was approved, I believe. That was fed. That was nothing to do with. Oh, but it's still a scenic one, right? It's. I, I assume the state and the federal are somewhat in line as far as. Well, I don't mean. In some points, but I mean, you know what I'm saying? I, I don't know how well you would define it if it's not. I mean, I see how historic ties into being more scenic because people like history and they want to go out and drive and see history and, you know, see specific attractions and points of attraction and stuff. And like the central tree, I guess, drive by the tree. But. <laughs> No, I, I, so I don't know how else you would define it. So I, I understand your point, Peter, but how are we going to find out a better way to define it than that? One would think scenic is visually appealing. Right. But which old stone walls, and which all have historical significance, is what I think a lot of this outlines. Can I make Tamika? Jeff oh, Jeff. Oh, thank you. Jeff Stillings, 3 Lord Lane. Uh, I too was at the meeting and uh, I'm also you know, a member of the Historical Commission, obviously. Uh, I am not familiar with a historic road designation in the bylaw. What we're going by is in the Rutland bylaw, the scenic road designation, which states that there are several <coughs> town commissions who are allowed to submit for town warrant uh, for a scenic road, the Historical Commission being one of them. Mm. We took the extra effort to write down the historic prominence on why it was important to us, although it certainly, as you just discussed, is not required to be in the warrant. Uh, but instead of just saying we would like Cloverdale Lane to be designated a scenic road, we went on and said, this is why it is historic. So we added that because that's the commission we come from, the historic commission. However, the bylaw itself under Scenic Road uh, doesn't say that it has to be historic, but it has to uh, have uh, you know, preserve the, the nature and character, I believe is the wording on it. But because we are the historic commission, we added that extra effort, which the planning board appreciated uh, because it did kind of bring it into full circle on a lot of things that, that they weren't aware of. And just like the chair said, you know, the stone walls weren't recently placed there. They were there for a reason and, you know, uh, from the early history of Rutland. So there is certainly a nexus and a connection to the scenic road and the bylaw specifically says that historical commission can weigh in on asking to have these placed onto the, uh, the warrant. So anyways, the uh, historical commission asks, respectfully asks that this be placed on the warrant, as does the planning board. And this was something that was left over from the annual town meeting that we uh, we waited to have this hearing, which was a public hearing, publicly posted. Uh, so we've, we, we believe we've satisfied all the extra requirements that has been asked on us. So uh, thank you, that's all. Sorry if I made for the chair. Um, in the packet of information we have in our packet, there's section 15C, which is the scenic road designation improvements fines bylaw. And then under that, there's why a scenic bylaw. The purpose of the scenic bylaw is to help the town maintain and enhance its rural small town character by ensuring that work done to trees and stone walls on the public right of way of scenic roads is done in a way that helps preserve the scenic, historic, and aesthetic characteristics of the public right of way. Establishing a scenic road bylaw is one of the action items in the town's master plan. So that was done previously with the previous master plan establishing the scenic road bylaw, but here to that point it specifically says to help maintain the historical aspect as well. So just if I could ask a question to Leah to on that based on one. So in the historical significance, the, the background information for this is gonna be a time meeting. You're suggesting that that should probably be the first paragraph in this in this document they're gonna use for background. Is that what you're saying? I'm just saying that that information is provided to us that well, it alludes to historic, which it kind of what, yeah. what Peter was asking. Just thinking in the, in the document you're going to present to the public at town meeting, that probably should be your first paragraph, mm -hmm. talking about the scenic, and then you can get into historical for information purposes. That's I mean, I think 
we as a board tonight can't necessarily do a whole lot of no. No. voting action. We can kind of verbally right. agree or disagree or whatever. Yeah. But I think, you know, and I think maybe that's what the Historic Commission and the Planning Board is looking for. Um, mm -hmm. Right, and, I, and I, I see the intent, and, and I mean, to be a devil's advocate, I mean, anybody can bring this up on the floor, so, you know, right. if you guys can research a little bit more, to so if you need to defend it any further, you'll have more information on the specific laws that the state are looking at. But, I mean, to me, it, it makes sense, historic, scenic, because, you know, that's what, that's what New England's all about. You drive around, you know, grew up next to Concord, and that's what everybody wants to do, drive around, see the bridges, and drive through the, and the same with the, you know, I can see if we were up in Vermont, you're just looking at foliage and mountains and farms. But um, so anyway, so a good good point, Peter, and I, I think worth somebody being ready to defend if it becomes an issue. But I see the intent. I just have a, a question, Peter, um, on something something along the lines. Has anybody thought about looking for grants and whatnot to put up markers <coughs> for some of these? Historic places, and then you know, you know, have some kind of a project where we've got something for the town uh, that somebody could go online and see, map out a route for what they want to look for and, and whatnot. Uh, to that point, we are working on trying to get a marker for the central tree. I can't recall, and uh, Lynn or Jeff, if you want to chime in. I can't recall of anything else offhand for that, but that would definitely be something we would be willing to consider by, by all means. Yeah. I can add to that if you want. So, okay, good to be Mr. Chairman. So one of the things that we want to look at uh, from the American Funds Act is the potential uh, use of some of that money to improve tourism, to make up for lost dollars. And one of the things that we've got to consider is the issue of signage to historical properties in town. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Putnam Park and right over there's really no signage to a lot of these things. And I think that that would enhance our ability to attract people along with a map of where these locations are. So I think uh, that could be something we work into that economic development piece and the historical nature of, of various properties if uh, it, and that signage could be part of that package. And speaking of the central tree, I know there's a lot of work being done around it. That uh, I don't know if anybody's and gone by and seen. Yeah, from the scouts, they're doing a nice job. So we appreciate the work that they're doing done. That they're doing to preserve that. It looks that really area. nice. So it looks very nice. Mm -hmm. All right. Does anybody have any other comments or questions? So as I said, I mean, obviously, the, it seems that the board has support, but we won't be able to place anything until we, we do the warrant. Yeah. So. Once the warrant comes in, I'll make sure we don't forget that thing. Let's make sure we get that on the. Uh, on the warrant, okay? Um, and if I may, Jeff has his hand. Oh, yes, Jeff. Uh, Jeff, again, through the old name. Yes, I think that was our intention in bringing this uh, before the board is to, uh, I guess, to be transparent on our intentions and to, I guess, to try to get uh, assurance that this would be placed uh, so that it, you know, that we can move on. So, and thank you on the uh, accolades on the central tree. It is near completion on that. We are working about a historical marker uh, for that. You can see that uh, Rick Longbottom with uh, Stone Builders Masonry uh, donated all his effort to make a very nice concave wall on it. If you, if you have an opportunity, drive by. It's night and day difference from the old uh, rickety fence that was around there to this nice uh, semi-circumference stone wall on there. So we are working on once that's finished by the Eagle Scout candidate, uh, we are working directly with them on some sort of historical marker, and we will be circling back to this board looking for some support for some sort of public recognition and unveiling some uh, ceremony on there. Thanks. You got any keys, Jeff? We're going to change all the locks now. Everybody in town Everybody has, has a key. key. <laughs> yep. No, we, we yep. appreciate your, your efforts in, in setting up those events. Ron. Yeah, Norman, Norman uh, Peter, uh, Peter, Peter Van Norman's not here tonight, but I want to thank you. I know that I actually have some patience on this scenic road issue because I really felt strongly the public should weigh in on this issue. I, I'm sad that they didn't weigh in since it was a post of public hearing, but at the very least, you guys gave them the opportunity to comment, and there was a lot more thought given to it. So I appreciate both you and Norm working together to get this done. All right, Absolutely. I know I thank asked you. you to do it, so thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you.
Uh, now we're looking at updates to the 300th committee. Um, so we've got point three new members and, and approve the resignations and the appointments. So three, three new and three resignations. So let's see what we have. <coughs> You have all three of them here, right? Got all three resignations I'm told have been given to you. And uh, the new members have uh, been there and are recommended by this, the 300th committee. So, the letters of interest. So the names are in the first in the first page of that. So should we do the I guess we can yeah, we, let's probably do the resignations as a slate. Okay. So I'll make a motion to accept the resignation of three um, members of the 300th committee: Zachary Palmer, uh, Christine Drolet, and Kyle Nandu. Nan Nandu, with regrets. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Roll call. Benoit, aye. <coughs> and aye. And Nichols, aye, with regrets as well. Now, if, do you want to do these individuals or do them as a slate as well the three replacements? And it's up to the person who wants to make a motion. They all have, I think, yeah, letters of interest as well as yeah. the chair of the 300th committee support. Yes. So. Are you okay? Are you guys okay making if I do it as a slate? Okay. I'll make a motion to appoint um, Dick Mozio, uh, well, Richard Dick Mozio, Margaret Peg Sullivan, and Kathy Anderson. I'm not going to be able to pronounce this last name. Kusinow. Kusinow. It's going to be close. Sorry, <laughs> Kathy. Um, to the Rutland 300th Committee. With <coughs> much appreciation. A second. Any discussion? Roll call. Benoit I. Whitman I. And Nichols I. Thank you very much. We appreciate the work that the effort from the members leaving as well as the commitment of the members coming. It's a lot of work and it's nice yeah. to see kind of the flow of people coming and going, you know, as they can and just knowing that they have that flexibility. So all right, uh, RRG contract for property tax assessment services for approval. That's a contract. Do you want to go? Sure. Mr. Chairman, this is a new contract. As you know, we've been using RRG for well, some time. Uh, they do a, a host of small communities all throughout the state. Uh, they're recognized as one of the leaders in this area. Uh, our experience with them has been very good. Um, and we had one really small issue that I could identify is that they were a little backed up uh, on building permits and, and getting approvals for uh, new additions to homes. Uh, that's been straightened out and we're back up to date. So I, I was happy about that. Uh, company is very, very good. It was put out through a regular uh, request for proposals uh, through the state procurement law and it meets all those requirements. They were the only company that uh, actually bid on this. The first year rate is what we have budgeted for. So no problems with our budget for the first year. Second, third year, I didn't calculate the exact amount, but it looked like around 2% increases. So it's reasonable increases. I think this is a really good company. Uh, the contract is reviewed by our legal staff, and I'm comfortable that this is a good uh, contract for the town of Rutland. Does anybody have any questions regarding you? Do you want to make a motion? This contract effectively started June. Oh, July 1st, just so you're sure. It's a three year contract? Three year contract, mm -hmm. yes. So I'll make a motion to approve the RRG contract <coughs> for property tax assessment services uh, effective June 1st, 2021, for three years, ending June 30th, 2024. <coughs> and do we have to make a motion to allow you to sign? Yeah, you can push the motion with, along uh, with the It's just a safety Town administrator to approve him. Yeah, What's so. providing a town administrator authorization to sign and approve? I'll second and then I have a comment. Okay. Um, the first page, number three, term of contract, says July 30th, 2024. July 
Yeah, it, it should be the end of June 30th. So it should be June 30th. June 30th. Not July. So I'm saying number three on the first page says July. Shall expire on July 30th. 20 yeah, I meant it to say June 30th. It should be June or July. Thank you. You are correct. Thank with, you. So with correction. With correction. <laughs> Do you have corrections, Carol? Um, that's all I see. Um, so I'll second again. Second okay. correction. Any other questions? I didn't see anything else, I guess. All right, roll call. Benoit I. Wait, Benoit. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And we already took care of the 96. Sorry, if I can, can these numbers just get forwarded directly to FinCom for... I know we're trying to be proactive as far as the budget, not mm -hmm. just for this current fiscal year, but going forward. I think it here has here the compensation dollars for the um, yeah, we can, year. Yeah, we can. Because you're going to provide all con Didn't Karen, you requested all contracts, right? So this would be inclu included, right? In the information. Yeah, we can include, sure. Okay, thank you. Um, before we go into our goals and objectives, we, I, I did get a notification from Lilac Hedge. Um, they, they were looking for approval to extend their um, license because they didn't get their permanent liquor license. Um, so daily license for a period of time. Uh, I, I did, they only found out this afternoon, so I didn't put it on the agenda because I didn't think it appropriate to be at such a late date. So if the board is amenable to having a meeting to discuss possible liquor license, um, I don't know if people, there's availability on Thursday. It'll be a short meeting. I didn't see anything on the town calendar, so I don't think there's any uh, room issue about it. That, I'm it's sure only going to be. Sure. Two. Can you with these? When do you want to do it? Th this Thursday. This they're, Thursday. They're, they're actually hoping to try to um, get it get it for this weekend. If not, then we would have to push it off till next Let week. Let me just so. check. Someone. What's the date for it? Do you remember off the top of this Thursday? I don't. I don't the 23rd. Okay, that's fine. Thank today? you. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, where am I? I don't know. I, know. <laughs> I don't even know where I am. Yeah. I, I know I know. I checked my calendar. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> Is that, does that work out? That okay? works fine for me. Okay, it would be very short. So, we, um, Ron, we will have um, did I did something? special meeting for Thursday. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, 6 o'clock is good with everybody. Yeah. This guy? This guy? 195? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I checked that off by mistake. I'm sorry. So I missed 195. Um, motion to approve Blue Sky Towers 3 oh, LLC yeah. to apply for necessary permits prior to the installation of wireless telecommunication facility. So I'm sorry. I missed. Thank you, Carol. Mr. Chairman, a few comments on this. As you know, we've been talking with this company. This is the company that wants to put the proposed cell tower on the, the road that goes past the two schools in Aquag and Central. Uh, this doesn't give them, the, the agreement we're trying to come to, and I think we've pretty much come to the agreement, is that uh, we would give them the right of way across the road uh, to be able to put in utilities and stuff uh, through across the road. And they would, in that terms, fund uh, for us a survey of that road so that we could uh, future develop that into a town road. We've agreed to do that. This doesn't give them any power to do anything. It just allows them to go to... Uh, I want to say the Zoning Board of Appeals or the, or the Planning Commission, there's a letter in there uh, just to start the process. That's all it is. Uh, so we will later, once we get the formal agreement, we will be looking for the exact right of way, and that will be drawn up by an attorney. But this just allows them to, to move forward uh, in that process um, and by going with their plan to the, uh, I believe it's the Planning Commission. Let me just see for a minute. Is it Board of Appeals? Mm -hmm. I know it's one of the two, I just, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, it's a variance and a special permit. Okay, so it goes to Zoning Board of Appeals. I have a cool. I, maybe I need to look at the map. I thought 285 Main Street. Oh, Main Street, never mind. So it needs to go over the town-owned property at 285 Main Street. It's going across the road, as I understand it. It's just, and frankly, if we ever make this a road, they won't even need this easement, or because... The road will be a public way. The reason they need it now, it's only a driveway. Mm -hmm. uh, that way they can't do it. So they need to have this because it's it's not a road. So if my question eventually, is, I'm where sorry. is 285, I guess? Is that the Naquag, the Naquag Central Tree Driveway currently? Is that essentially where that is? I thought, I my don't understanding is it it's... 285 is technically... Maybe you'd have a better way to describe that's it than me. That's, yeah. I'm trying to like orient myself. Yeah. And I just know that it's on the, the, 
you're trying to run it from the right side of the street to the left side of the street where the property is, but I'm not sure exactly where that is located. Maybe you have a better answer as to exactly where that property is, you know? All I can say is about halfway down, roughly, and that's on the left. That's yeah, all yeah. Joe told me. Yeah, yeah. I don't know the, how to describe the exact location. I, I when I drove by and saw the balloon testing, so I know where they're looking, to, <coughs> roughly where they're looking to put the tower. Yeah. Um, but I just didn't know where 285 was. As I understand, it's just from simply one side of the street to the other. It's mm -hmm. not that big of a deal, really. And and I've had in the assessor's office because I have to for. For law purposes, I have to have the assessor's office give me a, a value of what that easement or that right of way might be. Because if in theory, if it was worth fifty grand, it would have to be a procurement issue, but it's not. So, not an issue. But the, I got to wait for the assessor to give that to me. So Joe is going to provide the assessor uh, with that information, and it's a minor issue, but we got to get that done. Then I talk to the attorney; she'll have to draft the language for the right of way so that it comes back to the board. I think that formal right of way has to actually go to town meeting. Um, so it's got to go to town meeting. So I, I don't necessarily have any qualms about it, but I just am <clears throat> trying to visualize how it's going to be, knowing where Phillips Road is and then the 285 Main Street address, how that's off, like where, what it's going to entail, because it's a lot of woods there and everything. I don't, and 285 is Naquag, which, are they trying? You're talking, about the, you're talking about where the location of the cell towers. That's not private property, so we're really not involved with that. that. We could get you a map of the land if you'd like. I have of where it's going here. To go. I'm just trying to understand what the easement 285 is. Naquag. So, are they coming? The easement needs to come through private property. It's, to it's not coming to Main Street. The easement is not Main Street. The easement's going across. What's the name of the road that goes between the schools and the school? Rutland Heights Way. Rutland Heights Way. It's going just across Rutland Heights Way. So that's, I guess, where I'm confer confused. This letter of authorization is asking the town of Rutland, Massachusetts, is the owner of a certain parcel of land located at 285 Main Street with the assessor's map, lot 41, uh, map 41, lot A1, in the town of Rutland, Worcester County, Commonwealth, Massachusetts. So I guess I'm confused because I would expect that it's going to need to, is it, 285 is Naquag. So are we somehow doing something with Naquag or are we going through Rutland Heights Way? Like where exactly does it need to? My understanding is going through Rutland Heights Way. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, but the 285 is just the address of the lot that they're building on, right? But that's not where the, the right of way is going. The right of way is going across that street. When you're going down Naquag, heading to the Central Tree. Yeah. That's where it's going to tie in, and they're probably going to be tying into the electrical there to go across for the easement. But that lot must be defined as 285 Main Street, is why is why the address right. is talking so about Main Street. Street. It's not like so the front of the school, so it probably goes it's, way back. So to it's the lot yeah. that that's I guess where yeah. where where on that lot is the connection, and is there going to be impacts to the school or anything that we? No, need? No. no. Okay, that's my. No. So I, I think it goes road? much deeper than you're. Right. Involved. They're not going to dig up the road or anything yeah. like that. If they have to put. Power, you know, to grab power, but that would be it. Yeah. She let you do a but that's a, an overhead post or something there to bring the, the electricity across. It's not going out of the road. I don't. Either way, it doesn't say. I mean, it doesn't. I don't think it's. I don't think it's going on the road. It's on no private. It's on, on Mr. Bigelow's uh, old land there. So, well, again, this won't even be finalized. This is just giving me a lot to discuss it. Yeah. And it <coughs> knows about it, but it's not the easement and everything. So that's still going to be. It's just if they're digging it uh, on that driveway, essentially, yeah. that's an, a pretty crazy driveway around yeah. school time and so I wanted there to be considerations yeah, for I, I, what my my opinion or what I've heard I have not heard of anything going under the ground it's above the ground so I don't think there's any digging above I'll double check it but okay. that's my even work yeah. that's going on around yeah needs to yeah. I'm you know it's crazy with school so it needs to be yeah. a consideration of that's a school we, driveway with the little kids definitely so. will have that discussion like I said this is not really we're not really talking about doing it yet we're just Allowing them to discuss and give their plan to the Zoning Board of Appeals, that's all. Sheila, do you have a question? This just allows for discussion. Just to add to your notes for this, 285 Main Street is Naquag's official address. 281 Main Street is Central Tree's official address. So that roadway really is a driveway. It and is of a course, driveway. we've all had that conversation, you know, for many years about what it constitutes. But right. So I have one more question, though. So if 
you got the cell tire on 12 Phillips. What's you're going to go across the driveway? What's on the other side? What what are they connecting to? There's a, right. My understanding is there's a power line on the other side, right? Is there's a connection to the power, is what it is, isn't it? You tell you, I assume there was a power line, right? That, uh, but it says right in there, Joe's getting it surveyed from them right. to put in a complete street eventually. Yeah, I, just, right. I guess I was just wondering. Well, the first where are the wires going? Right. Where are they going to end I, up? I, I, is my understanding was they're going to go from one side of the street to the other, yeah. into the property. But the, the, that, and again, the, that was going to be temporary because if we accept the road, it's, they don't even need it for that. But that, I, mean, I didn't, I mean, they told me, it sounded like common sense to me that it's from one side of the street to the other, and that was it. But yeah. I mean, I think normally mm -hmm. it would be common sense. I just think that it's questionable because there's, that piece of property is very large and it's a school so i just want to know yeah. you know to me you're talking about main street which is the road that goes right here it sounds like in reality it's not going to be the road that goes right here it's going to be essentially the driveway correct mm -hmm. that but where does that then power line connect to and everything which i think i have to i mean i have to question. get them to, to draft on a map but maybe i can send you a map of it to be sure but but i, I you know i could be honest i don't have this specific thing in my head where exactly where it is on the street specifically has it, but I have plans for them posted on the Zoning Board of Appeals page. Okay. Um, there's quite a bit of information in there because they had a pre-application meeting already with the CBA. So what you're looking for might be on those documents. Yeah, it probably is. And if you want to take a look. So us approving this just basically lets them go to ZBA. Right, so they have all this does. Ready for us so this is just the initial, yeah, yeah, this right. is the beginning really approval. It's not yeah. a final approval on okay. it. Okay. Not even close. <laughs> so then... I will make the motion to approve the Blue Skies Towers 3 LLC to apply for necessary permits um, for the land located at 285 Main Street, uh, which would be necessary prior to the installation of a wireless telecommunication facility or a cell tower. And the, the uh, town administrator signature. Oh yeah, yeah, to be authorized by the town administrator. Well, second. Any other? All right. Uh, roll call. Benoit Dye. Whitman Dye. And Nicholas Dye. All right. So uh, l last is our goals and objectives, Economic Development Plan Committee. I know you've had some interest. Yeah, I sent you. I actually, you know, I, I think you guys are aware that I sent out a letter to all, all the people I have on a business list. I've been working on developing a business list, and I sent out a couple of letters. The first letter I sent out to them was, just to send them a whole list of resources that business leaders could use. Uh, the second letter was specifically about the Economic Development Commission. As a result of that letter, I have two different business people that have agreed to serve on the commission and have sent in letters. Uh, one, I've had an opportunity to meet um, the woman, I, I don't want to say Kathleen, I'm not sure if that's her first name, but very exceptional candidate. Uh, the other one is a gentleman uh, that owns a, a power company. Uh, when I say power, I'm thinking about like vehicles kind of power, not electrical power. But both of those members are business people in the community that are interested, so I'm glad to see we're starting to get people interested in that commission. I think it will be good. Uh, once we have a slew of candidates for you guys to review, one of the things you're going to have to decide is exactly the formal makeup of that committee because we, we kind of said, okay, we're going to create the committee, but we haven't locked down the memberships and stuff. So I think that that's very good news. Uh, so that committee is moving forward, and I'm hoping that soon we get... I think I originally proposed about seven members for that committee, so I'm hoping we get to that point. Uh, I've also sent out a letter to all the boards and commissions uh, asking them if they had any recommendations, because you remember part of the commission request was, you know, maybe a representative or delegate from, uh, or designee from like the Planning Commission, Conservation Commission. So I haven't got much in response from them, but trying to engage and get people to be interested. And I, I got to admit, um, trying to get people involved in boards and commissions these days seems to be extremely difficult. So it's slower than I had hoped, but it is moving in a good direction, and hopefully I have something to bring forward to you. So I'll bring forward with group. I've reached out to, you know, continue to reach <coughs> out to people around town and stuff also just, and se I've sent them the town website link, and I've also sent them the town center survey packet just as like a, you know, overview of kind of this is what some groundwork that may or may not be beneficial moving mm -hmm. forward on the group. That's terrific. So. Thank you. That's very helpful. So if any any board members do have anybody they could recommend, uh, I'm really I'm excited that we get a good team on this. I really think 
uh, we have a lot of area to cover and I think it could be really beneficial to the town if we get a strong, excited, and motivated group. So we'll see. All right, and then uh, upgrades to the town website. If you um, I'm actually, frankly, I had last week scheduled a meeting with Damien to have her train me on how to develop pages on a website, and it, for a variety of reasons, it just didn't come off. So I'm hoping this week uh, we can do some training to go through and so I can learn how to add stuff to the website. Um, I don't know, Madam Vice Chairman, if you have a, a thought for a new date for another meeting. Uh, no, we just, <laughs> just need to do it. But we will be meeting again. Um, boards and commissions we've kind of just again the only thing there is just you know we obviously try to recommend as, as empty spots come up we recommend to the board and the board looks for candidates for boards and commissions so that's kind of an ongoing process uh, that follows with human resources we do staffing we have made a job offer to a, that DPW worker uh, in the sewer division so to speak uh, we just sent it out I think Joe sent it hard mail yesterday we told them and after our interview that we were very interested in the candidate, um, we're, 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 we have to match the salary that he had in the other, his other DPW department that he worked in. Uh, and we can do that. The only downside to that is it doesn't leave many more steps if we match it. Um, but we're looking for a qualified candidate and we'll see. But uh, I would expect we can answer from over the next couple of days. I'd like to fill that spot and, and get that done. But other than that, I think all of our vacancies are full. I don't think we have any other positions. Uh, that we have to hire for and then lastly the budget um, obviously we really haven't started the budget process yet our finance director has asked for some information that we've been providing to her uh, we're going to work on some contracts we gave her some money on the uh, cares act funding we sent it to her um, our, our treasurer's oh she's sick today uh, was working on a, a spreadsheet that the finance director wanted about the potential issue we discussed about potential raises for non-union employees so she's doing a couple of variations and we'll be giving that to her i guess as soon as she's better hopefully tomorrow uh, so we're working on that and uh, the budget process will be here before you know it and uh, obviously the big issue that karen and i are waiting on the board select when are waiting on is that free cash number so we can make some decisions for the special town meeting uh, one of them being that non-union calculation if we can do anything or not uh, we also are going to have to look at potential projects to fund um, Called, I called up members in the business community and I happened to call a guy that was a former contractor, I think I told you, that is now the head of the facilities group for the school system. And he went on to tell me about the parking lots at Naquag and at Central and how bad they were and the town's responsible. So I looked up the lease agreement we had between the town and the school system in terms of uh, the agreement. Anything over, I want to say $35,000, the town is responsible for and I said to, I called Daryl up and I had a long conversation with Daryl uh, and said, Daryl, the requirement is that you provide me three, if you're, if this is your priority to do these parking lots, the requirement in the lease agreement says that you have to provide me with three quotes for this type of work and what you want and all that. And it turned into a long conversation about their, they have a five-year capital plan. And I said, well, I don't know that I've ever seen it. Could you send it to me? And I then got on the phone with Harry and asked Harry, the school system had ever given him a five-year capital plan? The answer was no. So there seems to be a disconnect in terms of communication between the school system and the town side of government and, and as it relates to uh, capital plans. So uh, Daryl has suggested the superintendent and suggested that he's going to send that to me so I can forward it to Harry and talk about it. Uh, but I think that that five-year capital plan uh, for the school system has to be integrated into the five-year capital plan we did. So there's a lot of work to that. That five-year capital plan, I spent a lot of time working on it, but because it, it's missing a lot of things, we got to keep building on it. And as I said to you, the facility management plan has to be incorporated. I asked Harry the, if the, if the uh, chair was going to, if they were going to incorporate the five-year capital plan or the five-year facility management plan into the capital plan, and he was going to meet with their committee to discuss that. And then now we got to put it in the schools, and eventually we'll have to put the pavement management plan. So that's it. A working document that I think is going to take us a couple of years to develop the way we really want it. But uh, I also said to Harry, I said, Harry, you know, one of the problems we have is funding for these capital improvements. And we're letting the buildings deteriorate, and that's not a good thing. And that we, we have to start looking at a potential bonding program 
to put in, for instance, those parking lots could be well over a million dollars if we had to do them. That we have to develop, the, the Capital Improvement Committee should be developing a bonding package for capital improvements that are required to be done. If we need roofs on a building or whatever it is, the, the most critical items, there's no way we're going to be able to afford out of free cash. So at some point, the town's going to have to make a decision about its facility management and might have to be a bond package that would go through a referendum process, an override process to, to look at facilities. So I suggested that, that the uh, committee should look at that, and I'd be happy to work with them, but, but we can't go on forever without making some of these major facilities management decisions uh, going into the future. So that's it's the beginning of the process, but uh, it's something I really think that the Capital Improvement Committee should be working with all of us on to get us some kind of plan that we could at least consider for the future. And that's where we are. Okay. Uh, I did touch base briefly with Karen. Congratulations <coughs> for being we have elected chair. Thank you. So I think we sh uh, should start thinking about scheduling some um, joint meetings, because uh, we had talked about even looking at some of the previous finances and stuff like that to so just have a better um, look going forward and through the bu budget process. So I know much like we're going to do um, the, the ad hoc committee, um, we probably should do something similar with the finance committee. How often would you want to meet Karen at this point, just briefly Well, I'd say let's give it a try the first time, because we've got to bring a lot of those envelopes and just look at all the stuff. Yeah. So this is going to be a long process, I think, the first time. And then I think it will get easier, but for the first time, it's going to be a tedious process because we're going to need two months worth of every single warrant so in case there's any questions during our meetings. All right. So, I mean, do, do you think it'd be too late? So we're going to meet with um, the bylaw committee two weeks from from the off Monday. So if we do the uh, the uh, the next off Monday, is that too is that waiting too I'll long? To, you want to I, I'll have to find out from my committee if they're available on Mondays. Okay. I oh, that's true. You yeah, I don't know Mondays. if they're available. I just said that you guys wanted to meet, so I can't. I okay. promise you that money. Are there other days that were, um, aren't bad or good well, for the I was. Our FinCon meeting is <coughs> still typically Thursdays, yes. and okay. are you still kind of doing one? I haven't been on recently, but are you? It's kind of before the budget season, right? So are you mm -hmm. doing as needed? Or are you doing what once a month, once every? No, yeah, it's as needed right now. But we've got those. We're, we've got uh, Peter for the thirtieth. I don't yeah. recommend you joining us that evening because that evening is going to be a long evening. And then we have those that we have to go over those signatories for, yeah. but does Thursday let's Thursday work Thursday so maybe we can just jump in with your meetings then yeah. if that's so after you meet with them the, then after then we can then, uh, do yeah, a joint I meeting could, yeah so I could just reach out to my committee and find out what you know is it okay if we continue with weekly yeah. meetings and then we should be all set because I'd say that at this point we'll be going right into the special town meeting after right it. right so okay sure. no, that'd be great so. who's going to be able to bring the these? Those big envelopes, because that's only and all questions have to go through those. We have to go through piece by piece, paper by paper. I'm sorry, just because I'm kind of babbled. What are you trying to We're gonna find out through looking at the warrants? What are you trying any to questions that we have of what's hit through each of these departments, if you have any questions as to, well, what exactly is that for, you have to go back to the source document, because that's so you're the only trying to look at the details of each time. line item. Mm -hmm. Well, if there's questions, well, yes. Yeah, as it comes up, so they did to drill down to a specific cost. Right. Um, and how far back? I mean, you're just looking at, like... Well, I think you said two months. Two oh, months. Two months, So okay. what's that? You know, that's 14 of those, isn't it? <laughs> okay. I mean, that's the bad news, because there's no electronic way to do it, which, it's, you know, is what it is. I'll do that. Who has them? Dan, warrants are, I think, think the treasurer is the one that keeps the warrants, and they go between the treasurer and the, the accounts department. I've just, I'm, I'm not trying to be an insulting. I've never seen it where a finance committee ever goes into warrants before, so this is kind of a new process. Uh, I understand what I guess she's trying to look for. It's, it's pretty detailed because in the detailed summary we give, it has the what the total bill was for, but it doesn't explain the bill. And I think okay. Karen's looking at the explanation of each bill. I mean, if you see a bill for seven grand in an account, we kind of want to know, was yeah. that for T-shirts? Was that for coffee and lunch? Or was yeah. that for some, you know, I mean, in all seriousness, but you got to kind of know, because there can be a lot of different bills that go through for a lot of different things. So right. And when we met with Dan, he said that, you know, in the past that some select board members and people have done that. They've well, the, gone and drilled down. Yeah, board of select board members do that, because you guys actually sign those warrants and go through. Right. 
Um, but it also tells you like where the money's been going. I, I'm just again, I don't, I don't. If this is what if they want to do all this work, it's up to them. But, but the um, we do a lot usually of work. what I'm sorry. We do do a lot of work. No, this is a lot. Year, this is even a lot, lot more. I know. So the the issue here is usually what I've seen. Again, I don't, I don't really care how they do it, but usually, like they get the report that I give them, the, the monthly ones right. or the, the ones you get. You do monthly or quarterly, whatever way you guys want to do it. Usually when you see the big line items, Karen's talking about $7,000, then during the budget process, that's usually when the finance committee members drill down to the department and say, you're spending 7000 this, what's that 7000 for? And they drill down during right. that process. That's where I've seen it. We're trying to be proactive rather than reactive, reactive. because starting in January, we're going twice a week, the three, four hours a night, going through these numbers, trying to make them all mesh. And there isn't a lot of time to do this. If we get familiar with everything, if every member gets familiar with what's going through, they'll be, we'll have more time to analyze the numbers versus just going, sure, whatever. I, I mean, it, I that's the it, thing. And it's yeah. not just us. It's the Board of Selectmen wanted to go through this the same way. We wanted to be more proactive rather than reactive. Yeah. Okay. All right. Does anybody have any other um, questions? Or anything? Something? If not, if somebody wants to make a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.